in the city and here in Albany. Um, so we might as well get started. Um, so this is the opening. We're going to start with the project review committee. Um, we're going to start with Hilda. Hilda is the chair of the committee. Uh, so Hilda, the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we have 18 projects So what we're going to do is I will do the first the morning session and then Mike will do the afternoon session. So the first project is the uh, Recovery Center of Niagara. And that was presented at the June meeting. And there were some questions that the committee members had. So the project was stable. Uh, since then, you received, you received all the, the answers to the questions that we had. So, Jen, do you want to uh, present the, the project? And then we'll take it to a vote. If there is any, any questions. Um, so this is Recovery Center of Niagara, and it was presented um, last time. It's basically for a new Oasis provider for two levels of care, inpatient and detox services. It's located in New Fane, New York. Um, the applicant uh, is a, a LLC. Debbie Freeman, who may be in the city today, um, and it's for uh, what else? Uh, ancillary withdrawal services. Yep. yep. That's 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 the synopsis of the synopsis. And, and as you referenced, Hilda, um, at the last meeting, after uh, extensive discussion and public comment, uh, the council uh, voted to defer the application to this meeting. Um, provided Oasis with questions. Um, which we provided answers to via memo in the agenda packet. So um, you're available to discuss any of those questions any further. And, and for any particular questions of the applicant, uh, I believe Mr. Friedman is available. Any questions? <clears throat> okay, if there isn't any question, I'll make a motion uh, for the approval of this project. Uh, could I have a second, please? A second. second, Michael. All in favor? Aye. Abstain. 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 Oh, who's abstaining? Debbie. Debbie. Debbie's abstaining. And Donna May, uh, DePaula has stepped out of the room here in Albany. Donna May. Okay. Um, opposed? If not, motion carry. I, I just want to add just real quick. I just want to thank yes. the, uh, Oasis for their response. I think that was very helpful and very, you know, really helped helped a great deal in terms of clarification. So I just want to thank the Oasis that's there for doing that. The second project uh, is an Oasis project and it comes from Cayuga Health System, sponsored by Ithaca Alpha Health Center. Cayuga Recovery Service as operator, and the application is 2022.048, and this is in, uh, they are planning to become a new sponsor, and they are in Tompkins County, and it will be presented by Jennifer. Yep, Jennifer. Thank you. Yep, Cayuga Health Systems is requesting Oasis's approval to become sponsor of Ithaca Alpha House Center, DBA, Cayuga Addiction Recovery Services, or CARS. Uh, CARS is currently an OASIS certified provider with one part 820 residential service in Trumansburg and a part 822 outpatient treatment service and opioid treatment program in Ithaca. CARS will remain its current executive leadership team and its current approach and philosophy regarding the treatment of substance abuse disorders will remain. There are no new services being proposed in connection with this action, and there will be no changes made to the approved 2022 CARS budget. Yuga Health Systems has programs which are currently licensed by New York State Department of Health and Office of Mental Health, which are reported to be in good standing. 
The Tompkins County Mental Health Department and OASIS recommend approval with the following contingency. Copy of the filing receipt from the New York State Department of State indicating that the amended certificate of corporation, including the OASIS required language has been filed. Are there any questions? Yeah, I have a question. It's yes. Ian Schaefer. I'm just trying to be clear on the definition of the word sponsor. <clears throat> So a sponsor is an over, in this case, is acting as a oversight body and basically the purse strings for the program. So they're going to be supporting them financially as well as some administrative oversight. But the operator remains the same. The service delivery will come come from the existing OASIS provider. It's just a added layer of um, oversight, if you will, administrative. It seems like CHS. And CARS are uh, join, joining together, and they they have an affiliation going. I, so I can't are there any you. other questions? I'm having a hard time hearing you. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I said no. They are not integrating. Isn't there an affiliation going between uh, CHS and CARS? Yes, the affiliation is the sponsorship. Okay. Any other questions? Concerns? If not, I make a motion for the approval of this project. May I have a second? Second. <laughs> second. Carrie. All, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <clears throat> Abstain? Motion carried. Thank you. We are moving to project number three. And uh, this is the applicant is under Angels Wings Recovery Center, LLC. And the application number is 2022. Uh, 039. And they are asking to become a new OASIS provider of Part 822 outpatient services with ancillary withdrawal and telehealth services. And this will be presented by Dina Holmes. Thank you. So, in addition to what Hilda just said, services will also include admission assessment, treatment planning and review, trauma informed individual and group counseling, as well as medication assisted treatment. Services will be delivered in person through telehealth, in person and through telehealth, and will be provided in three languages, English, Polish, and Spanish. And the age of patients will be 16 and up. The provider intends to serve the community at large, but also plans to have a special focus on licensed professionals and face additional stigma for addiction, such as members of the New York City Police Department, Fire Department, and FDNY. In addition to that, medical professionals and other professionally licensed individuals, offers of our operation will be Monday through Friday and will be tailored to meet patient needs. There are two current owners, Monica Sergi and Anna Maria Mendez, both bring experience in the provision of substance use disorders. The New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, as well as OASIS, recommend approval with the following contingencies verification of the hiring of staff. Copy of the filing seat, filing receipt from the New York State Department of State <coughs> and um, making sure that those documents include the uh, required OASIS language. Is there any questions? Yeah, it's me again. I have one. My day for questions. Um, they're Monday to Friday. Um, do they have a relationship with an organization that can assist their member, the people they are treating when they are closed? Someone has an emergency on Saturday and it's their patient reaches out. What do they do? Where do they go? Is the applicant in New York City? They are in Kings County, uh, Brooklyn, New York. I'm sorry, is, is Monica or, or um, Anna Maria present in New York? 
No. Doesn't look like it. No. No. Okay. They, okay. So um, I can I I certainly know that they have a lot of uh, memorandums of understanding with other services. I'm not sure if they're set up for a hotline. If that's the actual question, um, I could certainly find that out for you. But the, um, it really is if somebody has an issue. Yeah, where do they call versus walking into an emergency room or an urgent care center? With somebody who has no affiliation back to the, the group that's treating them, they have, in my mind, as a practicing clinician, if I'm not around, I have to have somebody covering me. I think they need the same thing. That's a great question. I can certainly go back to the applicant with that. Well, I believe that uh, programs like that normally have a, uh, a special phone number. Uh, where people can call after hours. I mean, I used to be the CEO of a non for profit and I had that. So, could we make that a contingency of approval? Yes. Okay. So, I'll take it to a vote. Uh, make a motion for the approval with the contingency that we find out uh, what's the plan for after hours. If there is an emergency, so are, so I'm assuming you're talking uh, about after hours like 9 p.m. or on the weekends because they do it on weekends. Right. Correct. Yeah. Yes. So I do know that they submitted um, policies and procedures for emergency type situations. I just don't recall off the top of my head if it specifically spoke to um, hours when they're closed. Now I would assume that on their directory, you know, when you call, that there would be the standard if this is an emergency, please go to, you know, your local wherever, but um, they were invited today, so I'm a little surprised they're not there, but if, if, if need be, I can uh, get a hold of them, perhaps by this afternoon's meeting and address that. I've made okay. uh, raised uh, relatives. Question. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, this is Deb. Um, okay. I know the provider is not present, but can Oasis speak to their collaboration with the four other providers in the Sunset Park area? Okay. So, as part of their initial proposal, they had meetings with their um, local, with the local providers in the community, and they have received support not only from the community board, but from the LGU as well. And they did get some um, letters of support from the other applicants and other providers in the county. Including the four outpatient providers in the Sunset area? I could look back in my folder and prepare that for this afternoon to get the exact names of the agencies that they collaborated with, if that would be helpful. Okay, um, so I'm gonna take it to a vote uh, with the contingency that we will get that information this afternoon. Uh, motion to approve with that contingency. Can I have seconds? Second. Uh, all in favor? Uh, Stand by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Abstained? Abstained. Motion carried. Who's abstained? You have an abstention. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know the very well. Was there someone abstaining? Yes, yeah, Donna Donna May abstain. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Donna May abstained. Donna May. Oh, Donna May. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> uh, let's move to project number four. And uh, the applicant is Family Residences and Essential Enterprises, Inc. And the application number is 2022-009, and they are asking to become a new OASIS provider of Part 822 Outpatient Treatment Services, and they are located, they are going to serve Suffolk County, and that will be presented by Michelle Woods. That's right. Uh Family residences and essential enterprises propose to um, provide outpatient services that will be integrated with their Article 31 licensed clinic and will serve existing patients who are diagnosed with co-occurring mental health disorders as well as 
uh, services we offer to members of the community. The clinic will provide services in person and through telehealth. Services will be client centered and include education, medication assisted treatment, psychotherapy services, including individual and group counseling, vocational services, peer support services, and outreach. They intend to serve approximately 150 individuals annually, and their hours of operation will be Monday, Thursday, and Saturday from 8 a.m. to 4, and Tuesday and Wednesdays from 8 a.m. to 6. Uh, Family Residence is a domestic not-for-profit corporation founded in 1977 to provide support for individuals in, with intellectual and developmental disabilities, mental health, illness, and traumatic brain injury, and are licensed by OPWDD, as well as the Office of Mental Health, and they are in good standing with both. The board of directors consists of 12 members, two of which meet the OASIS requirements in managing or operating substance use disorder services. Suffolk County Department of Health Services and OASIS recommend approval with two contingencies. One is a copy of the filing received from the, from the New York State Department of State, indicating that the amended certificate of incorporation, including the OASIS uh, required language, has been filed and the hiring of staff. And we have two representatives from this program, David Barholm and Nicole Wolf are in New York City. Are there any questions about this project? Yes. No. I've yes. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, you guys want to come up? Come yeah. up. You know where to sit. That's all right. <laughs> Morning. Good morning. Okay, so what's the question? So the question is similar to the question before. And if you want to introduce yourselves, um, you can go ahead sure. and introduce yourself. I'm Nicole Wolf. I'm the Chief Program Officer of Community Services at Family Residence. David Barholm, Vice President of Quality and Support with Family Residence. Welcome. So I think the quick question is to talk to us a little bit about the interplay of the boat clinics and times, because we recognize the Oasis Clinic will not be open in the evening hours and also on weekends. Yeah. Well, it looks like it's not open on Friday. No, it's not open. No, we're, we're open. Oh, Just okay. we have different hours okay. for um, we have extended hours on. Tuesday, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and Monday, Tuesday, Friday, we're open until 4 o'clock. Oh. We'll be extending our hours as well, um, moving forward. And what is the rationale that sort of put the, the time in play in terms of how you selected the hours? Is there some sort of assessment? What, what was the, the, the rationale behind that thing? So, so the clinic when um, was part of another agency organization that we took over in 2015 um, that served approximately 75 people out there. Right. So this has been a, a growth trend. So we start with the old age uh, license and we grew it uh, right now our census is 711. So in the years we've grown, uh, that uh, that number that you got earlier is our always population people diagnosis that we able to serve. So basically we're in a, sort of the middle of the movie. Uh, right. As we continue Makes to sense. grow, That's so we used to not even have the six o'clock. So right. basically, as we felt the need and we see the need, yeah, yeah. and that's what we continue to do, yeah. including weekends. But we kind of want to build capacity and grow. We don't want to open twenty four hours. Got it. And have not. Exactly. Just a question, also, and I appreciate the fact that you're focusing on co-occurring disorder as well. Can you talk a little bit about the integration between staff and also models that you guys are incorporating? Sure. So um, several of our staff actually do come from OASIS providers. Um, and, you know, most of us do know that there is some co-occurring underlying um, disorders there. So we, uh, we kind of really, with, with that end in mind, we started really working with the staff to train um, and kind of get the, the service they need. We, we participate in the FIT program in Columbia. Um, we really kind of, you know, even with our pros programs and our forensic program, we has a lot of forensic. Uh, and crisis respite programs that we work with and we kind of use those staff to help form uh, what goes out there. And that's kind of really what uh, perpetuated this, this discussion and really got it going. Uh, plus our, um, we're in our second year of our CCDHC uh, demonstration, um, which has been very successful. Uh, so this is kind of that, that, again, that movie that we're really kind of, really trying to support that. Oh, thank you. 
Just another quick question in terms of the population. Is there an interplay with the, your, your traditional clientele around intellectual and developmental disabilities? And, and what does that look like in terms of treatment? Sure. So, so our, um, our clinic um, has a strong, uh, well, free in general, has a large IED right. population. Right. We're kind of known for that. And right. Mental health yeah. substance abuse is kind of the growing part of our business. Right. Um, so what we really found is that there are a lot of individuals with IED that have a lot of uh, history as well as mental health. Um, and part of our growth has been servicing those individuals as well, not just for free, but without. So we have a, somewhat of a specialization, a specialization there. Um, and then we're kind of trying to really incorporate that substance abuse model and treatment to that population, knowing that we have a lot of background and experience. And and is there a particular clinical model that you're using for integrated treatment? Uh, we're still kind of learning and, and going as, as as we kind of move forward in, in our direction. Um, you know, we, we use a lot of you know the evidence based practices that we've been accustomed to patient interviewing, and, um, sorry, cognitive behavioral therapy things that are, are very like that we could really break down for individuals that may not have that. Uh, functioning uh, to work with, but um, as we kind of get more involved, we work with the techniques. And I just noticed in your staffing, you have a full-time LGBTQ liaison. Could you talk a little bit about what the needs assessment around that particular position? Sure, yeah. I mean, we, you know, it's a, a part of our disparity statement when we were doing FCCB, so we really looked at populations around Long Island uh, that are served and vulnerable. Um, we saw that there is a need um, of a lot of individuals that we've supported. Percentage wise, it's not overwhelming, but we started to see that there are some people that identify as transgender, non binary. Um, so we are looking towards kind of supporting that population as we grow because we do see it becoming more and more. Can you talk to us about your plan for medication assisted treatment? Sure. Um, I think uh, all of our all of our prescribers, except for one, uh, who is going through the um, credentialing process are MAT approved. Um, our psychiatrist is board certified for children, substance abuse, and mental health. Um, is going to take the clinical lead um, and support the, the practitioners, the assistants, and all that are in our clinic to um, educate, help, uh, understand how to provide and support. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? If not, I make a motion for the approval of uh, Family Residences and Essential Enterprises Inc. Uh, project. Can I have a second, please? Second. All in favor, say by saying aye. 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 Amen. Aye. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> Opposed? <laughs> Abstentions? Motion carried. We are moving right along. Project number five. And this, uh, the applicant is Rigo Park Counseling LLC. And the application is 2022-038. And basically what they are requesting is a change in ownership of their part 822 uh, uh, clinic. And Linda Hefferon will be presenting this project. Yeah. Yes, this is Rita Park Counseling Center. They have um, requested a change in ownership of their outpatient program. I think that's their, an, an old owner, an older owner, Nina Hyorin, who had held 10% uh, of ownership in Rigo Park Counseling retired and divested herself of her ownership interest. And Dr. Raul Aloa, the current medical director at Riga Park, has purchased Ms. Iorian's 10% interest. And he has the required substance abuse disorder background. Emmanuel Calendera will retain his current 90% ownership. There are no changes to the existing services um, as a result of this application. And the New York State Department or New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and Oasis Regional Office have both recommended approval. Are there any questions about this change in ownership? 
I just have it's Sabina sitting. Um, just a yes. quick, small clerical note. It looks like in the LG you report there's a different name, the original owner. It doesn't say Nina Loran. I just want to make sure that the original owner is Nina Loran and not Emmanuel Calendera. Uh, Emmanuel Calendera is still um, uh, still owns ninety yeah. percent. Sure. Yeah, it says in the LG you report that he will that he's the one who's transferring. Oh. No, that that must be a, a, a typo oh, because oh, yeah. you know, he's he's continuing to hold the ninety percent, and Doctor Al Aloa um, will have the additional ten percent. Got it. Any other questions? Okay, motion for the approval of this uh, project. Could I have a second? Michael, second. All in favor, say by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Thank you very much. You're not right along to project number six. And this applicant is New Day Treatment Center LLC. The application number is 2022 005. And uh, they want to become a new OASIS provider of Part 822 outpatient services. And Linda Heffron will be presenting that project. Linda? Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, this is New Day Treatment Center. They are requesting OASIS approval to become a new provider of Part 822 outpatient services in Far Rockaway. They plan to provide individual, group, and family counseling along with medication-assisted treatment. They will also offer identified gender specialty groups along with groups for LGBTQ+, youth, elderly, those with co-occurring mental health issues, and their significant others, as well as parenting groups. New Day plans to provide a flexible schedule that fits into the client's present life schedule and will be open 365 days per year, including all holidays. They plan to operate Monday through Thursday from 8.30 a.m. to 9 p.m., Friday from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m., and 8.30 to 1 on both Saturday and Sunday. They were established, New Day was established on August 24, 2021, as a New York State Domestic Limited Liability Corporation, and they are comprised of three owners, Chaim Ginger, Joel Friedman, both of whom own 45%, and Paul Creary, who will own the remaining 10%. Mr. Creary has, the 15, has 15 years of prior and current experience in the delivery of substance use disorder services and meets OASIS ownership requirements. Mr. Ganger has six years experience in the financial field and currently works in real estate development. And Mr. Friedman has experience in the pharmaceutical field and is currently a vice president of operations at a skilled nursing and rehabilitation facility in another state. The New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and OASIS Regional Office recommend approval and we recommend approval with the following contingencies. The verification of hiring the appropriate staff, the OASIS final inspection and approval of the completed facility, and a copy of the filing receipt from the New York State Department of State indicating that the amended articles of organization, including OASIS language, have been filed. Okay, are there any questions for Linda? I, I do have Paul Creary and Chris Dennehy are in, in New York City and can answer any questions that anyone may have. Well, I guess welcome. I have a question. Yes. Um, and in response to the overall financial condition of the provider, I just want a little more information about that. I know it says that the regional office reviewed the budget submitted, but we don't have any sort of uh, language or clarification. So I'm just trying to figure out exactly if they have the financial ability to be true. Sure. 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 Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, buddy. Good morning. So, my name is Paul Freire, and I'm one of the owners for New Day. And uh, Chris Dennehy, consulting, clinical consultant. Great. No, I appreciate this. If you could just sort of talk a little bit about the, the financial piece, given that you're 
a for profit and you're not getting any state dollars. So talk a little bit about that. So uh, basically what we have is we've already put into uh so into the bank, we've shown uh six months worth of funds that are in there to cover for the expenses for all of the staff. Comes out to about six hundred fifty thousand dollars. That's already sitting in the bank. We've proved that in showing statements, bank statements to OASIS. So we have funds to hold us over. Uh, in my prior life, I've done uh, extensive work with uh, many of the healthcare facilities in doing contracting, and that's one of the things that I'll be doing. So I will be setting up contracts with both the managed care companies as well as getting us involved with Medicaid. So that, that as soon as we get the provisional license, I'll be able to do that. And at such time, we'll be able to have contracts and be able to get reimbursements as quickly as possible. Any other Thank questions? Um, as, a, as, a, as a family member, I guess I just have a couple questions. Um, and what percentage of the of the population do you say you think will be young people? How much you talked about parenting groups, and I'm just wondering what that family work is going to look like. So, so I'm hearing a couple of questions, but the the um, so the um, parenting group is for the adults who are parents. Uh, so yeah, parenting so adults sober with parenting. Cool. Yes, okay. sober parenting. It's a it's a okay. structured um, evidence based. Okay. Program. Okay. All right. So you're only serving adults, not. Oh no! We're, no, we also serve okay. people have uh, children. Yeah, adolescents. Eighteen. So it's, it's as as they come in, what the need is for the, for the family, for the individual, the identified person. Is that helpful? And, yeah. Raises other questions, but yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, We're here. Yeah. Uh-huh. And what percentage of the families you, are you serving, do you think, are Medicaid eligible? Or what percentage do you think are private eligible? So um, with our previous experience, we anticipate that they will be a much larger percentage. Obviously, fee-for-service Medicaid is something that's not pretty much gone away. They'll probably be about 5% of that. And then uh, I'd say at least 75 to 80% will be managed Medicaid, at which point we'll also have at least, uh, I'd say about 10 to 12% will be commercial insurances, private insurances, and we'll have a population of about maybe 3 to 5% that is self-pay. And for self-pay, we will have a number of different things. We will have uh, sliding scales. We will also, I, as the person responsible, I'm going to ensure that no one really comes in and doesn't get the services. So we will find scholarships as needed. So, um, and, and, any other questions? Uh, I have two. Uh, okay. When no, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So I know the area well, so this is probably why this question. Um, Far Rockaway is an extremely challenging and, and an area that definitely needs a service, um, but also is limited in terms of medical facilities. And there's a lot of comorbidity with patients who um, need mental health and substance abuse services. Can I have your attention, please? So Can I have your attention, to... Mr. Building Fire Life Safety Director? What is your plan to really deal on the medical side, the comorbidities of patients that you will be servicing in that area? <coughs> what are some of your connections? Oh, you could say absolutely. So we actually uh, <laughs> signed several MOUs already. So, uh, in terms of if an individual were to need a higher level of care where it would be inpatient detox or inpatient uh, rehab, we have connections with Cornstone Treatment Facilities, which is probably the largest facility for detox and rehab in the Queens area. I have extensive connections there. Uh, and then we've also got animal views for the more uh, behavioral health side with the Rises Counseling Center. We've also connected with the St. John's Business Hospital. I had a meeting with them and uh, the, the psychiatrist who runs uh, their uh, their department, as well as the VP of Behavioral Health Services. And they are working with us extensively to be able to transition patients back and forth. We're also working with Joseph Adabo Friends. So I believe that with that mix, we pretty much have a good uh, ability to, to 
and, exactly. and clinically, it's it's we're, we're not the end all be all. So so they can be working with those services as well as working with us. We're not looking at it's got to be in our house and not nowhere else. And then we also have a LMHC on board and looking to uh, we have a social worker that we're talking to. So we'll have therapists on uh, who can work more with those, uh, especially the mental health pieces in comorbidity with the substance abuse so that can experience it in the case acts, but also have graduate level therapists. And I guess just one other quick question, kind of pursuant to what Deb was saying in terms of the demographics, because I don't know the area. Um, and and can you talk a little bit about the, the population, the demographics of the population served, and um, is there it, diversity in, in language? Um, yes, it's a very diverse uh, community. Uh, there are uh, uh, the blacks, there are Hispanics, there are, uh, there is a very big Hasidic population, which is not that far away. And, Two other towns very adjacent to that, um, so we're we're cognizant of that, and what we're doing is we're trying to find therapists that would be able to speak to <coughs> specifics because they each bring something very different to the picture. So uh, we do have Spanish speaking counselors already, and we uh, we've gone through several people that we believe will be able to uh, address the issue, which has a very different. Scenario altogether. Just a follow up. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no I was going to ask and, another question. Go ahead. Oh, and Chris was also saying that we have a translator on board. Or not the system. Board, yes. The system. 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 Correct. Okay. Not on board. <laughs> right. Yes. Just as a follow up to that question, do you find it difficult to uh, get? uh latino employees in that area it's difficult to get all of them all of <laughs> exactly. i know right. i know that, that's the basic in. answer but uh, <laughs> we are we have actually been su successful in finding two people that are uh hispanic speaking uh, thank you right. any other questions I do one last final, one last final yes. annoying question. But when we're talking okay. about doing family work, do you yeah. have any um, any vision of incorporating um, peers, family yeah. peer support, or the, yeah. into the model? And what we have a work? well, we have a SERPA, um, but then also the the um, family peer. We're, okay. we're looking at that as well. Yeah, okay. um, and and engaging in terms of the clients and alumni too, and right. you know, speaking to the family piece. Um, it, it's that's a broad question, so that. There's the encouragement from the moment of the, the initial phone call of him, you know, asking if anyone who's coming with you to your intake, you know, and that will have family groups, multi-family groups. Okay. So, yeah. uh, thank you. Any other questions? If not, I'm going to take it uh, for a motion to approval of this project. Could I have a second? Second, David. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carry. Thank you very much. Aye. Moving on to project Aye. number seven for OASIS. And the applicant is Central Park Recovery LLC. And the application is 2022-041. And they are asking for a change in ownership of their Part 822 program. And they are located in Westchester County. And I believe that Linda Heffron will be presenting. Am I yes. correct? Yes. Yes, okay. that's the part Take it away. Okay, thank you. Central Park Recovery has been an OASIS certified provider since July of 2021. They're requesting OASIS approval for a change in ownership of their Part 822 outpatient and outpatient rehab programs located in Yonkers. One of the current owners, Stephen Giofrida, is divesting himself of his interest in the program and plans to sell his 90% interest to Mark Bassani, who will have 85% interest, and Melissa Mandela will have 5%. Mr. Bassani is the current landlord and owner of the building that Central Park Recovery leases, as well as the CFO for Central Park Recovery. And Ms. Mandela is an LMHC and a KSAC-T, 
and the current assistant clinical director of Central Park Recovery. The third owner, Nicole Intervallo, will continue to hold her remaining 10% interest. Um, she currently has 10%, she will hold that 10%. Nicole has always required experience in managing substance use disorder treatment services. Existing services will not be affected by this action, and the Westchester County Department of Mental Health and OASIS Regional Office recommend approval. Questions? No questions for me, then? Matt, I make a motion for the approval of this project. Could I have a second? Second, second. All in favor, state by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Stay. Motion I'm staying. Michael. Hello? Yes. Hi, I'm yes. staying, Michael. Michael, you're abstaining. Thank you. Uh, project number eight. And this is uh, the applicant is Westchester Jewish Community Services Inc. And the application number is 2022-2034. And they want to become a new OASIS provider of part 822 uh, services, and they are in Westchester County. And Jennifer will be presenting. Thank you. Um, yes. So yeah, Westchester Jewish Community Service is proposing to open a new Part 822 outpatient service um, in Hartsdale with an additional location to be co-located at their Article 31 clinic in Mount Vernon. Services will be offered to adolescents, adults, and family members, and will be delivered through evidence-based approaches with a particular emphasis on self-determination and clear principles of harm reduction. Therapies will include cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, medication assisted treatment, motivational interviewing, motiv motivational enhancement therapy, and family therapy. The proposed hours of operations for both locations are Monday through Thursday, 9 a.m. to 7 p.m., Fridays, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Westchester Jewish Community Services is a non profit organization founded in 1943 and one of the largest providers of services in the county. They are currently licensed by the Office of Mental Health and are in, are good, and are in good standing. The board of directors consists of 31 individuals with three board members holding OASIS required experience in the delivery of substance use disorder services. The Westchester County Department of Community Mental Health and OASIS recommend approval with the following contingencies, verification of the hiring of staff, uh, OASIS inspection and approval of the completed facility, which effective today has been completed, and a copy of the filing receipt from the New York State Department of State indicating the amended articles of organization, including the OASIS required language, have been filed. Are there any questions for Jennifer? Drew Mullane is in New York City. If there are any questions, I have a question. Let's your turn. Uh, well, it's good to hear that you're going to do some harm reduction. So how, how does that play out in terms of evidence-based? So it's a fair question. So we are we are principally an OMH provider, uh, been doing uh, integrated services under an iOS waiver uh, for the last many years. Um, we are continuing to build out our harm reduction practices. We participate in OMH's uh, overdose uh, uh, prevention initiative on an ongoing basis. So we're rolling out Narcan um, and Narcan distribution within our clinics with providers, uh, clients essentially being notified about Narcan in our waiting areas, um, uh, pointed in the direction of their clinician or any other staff, um, and then our prescribers will write Narcan prescriptions. We're also working with uh, the Department of Community Mental Health to identify resources in terms of uh, obtaining fentanyl test strips uh, and such. Um, so we're taking that tact uh, for one. We're also uh, implementing uh, a strategy of rolling out uh, as part of this proposal in our Hartsdale clinic, uh, there will be an ambulatory detox that's tied to a six-week IOP program. 
uh, that will be induction of suboxone uh, and or other medication assisted treatment to reduce harms uh, like maybe overdose, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we're going to continue to expand that on reduction practices as time goes. Okay. So you, can, you can also integrate harm reduction engagement and regular treatment services. Oh, yes. Which is collaborative treatment planning. Um, lots, of, uh, lots of success. Yeah, and, and one of, I, will, I will mention that a harm reduction approach yeah. is principle to uh, essentially our underlying philosophies. Uh, so some of the evidence-based practices that we utilize already uh, is dialectical behavior therapy, inclusive of DBT uh, for substance use disorders, uh, but we're also one of five organizations in Westchester County that are utilizing the Encompass Treatment Protocol, which is a modular evidence-based treatment approach for youth and transitional age youth with co-occurring uh, co disorders. Um, and that takes a harm reduction approach um, in that the client sets the goals um, and essentially we go there with that client and move along um, as time passes. Thank you. Any other questions? Sabina, I have a question either for Oasis or for you. There's a note <coughs> sorry, fixated on the LGU report. There's a statement in the LGU report that says that there are outstanding issues of contracts that withhold the Westchester County. Could Oasis elaborate on what that means? I um, I can't hear anything. Oh, I don't sorry. Know what the was. There were outstanding questions. So right. I can answer that. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, yeah, so Jennifer, uh, you might remember uh, that uh, when uh, the representative from DCMH submitted the contract, uh, that report, uh, he wrote, there were outstanding issues. He, I pointed it out to him that he said that, and he submitted a updated report that said that there were no outstanding okay. issues. Yes, um, I will uh, verify uh, that. <laughs> Yeah, that is, yeah. That, that is true. So we uploaded the wrong, the wrong report. He did send yeah, a corrected one, report. It's one of those rare occasions where I actually like read over something a second time, and I'm like, I read that? Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Comments, so I, have, I have a question. Yes. I just have a quick question um, in terms of the treatment model. And what percentage of your clientele do you think will be youth? young adults and what percentage will be adults? Do you have a sense? Yeah, so by proxy of the uh of the Encompass Treatment Program right now, and by proxy of the fact that we've been trying to continue um, our expansion of uh, community reinforcement and family training, um, and also by proxy of the fact that the majority, about 50% of those we serve already are youth, um, we expect that that continue to be the case. And in fact, uh, under the Encompass model within our OMH clinics currently, I would say the vast majority of our clients are youth and transition age youth. And can you talk a little bit about your continu continuum of care and how we continue to engage <coughs> families, particularly families of, of young people with co-occurring disorders? Uh, absolutely. So uh, we are uh, the Encompass model, which I've mentioned already, but also DPT. Um, all of those models tend to be principally focused on the individual level of treatment. Um, and so we recognize the necessity to also offer craft or community reinforcement and family training uh, to support family members because we recognize uh, that uh, families are trying their best to support uh, their loved ones and, and oftentimes kind of us here or there to do so. Um, so we're utilizing craft act actively. Uh, we've been uh, lucky enough for OMH to grant us uh, 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 OM, uh, an OMH, I believe, uh, COVID-related bot grant um, that will actually allow us to work with uh, Robert Myers of the University of New Mexico, I believe, um, to do a craft training for our Encompass team clinicians already. Um, but uh, over the course of the year, uh, with monthly or even maybe uh, bi-weekly supervision from Dr. Myers himself. Uh, so we'll continue to build that out as a core piece um, and a recommended piece when people come in for treatment. Um, and I've mentioned the Encompass model again and again, but I want to be clear, the Encompass model is, uh, it, it really uh, incorporates all of the evidence-based practices that you would want to see for treating co-occurring disorders. So we've expanded that past the youth transitional age youth to uh, offer it to all uh, clients incoming. Um, part of that is also medication management um, 
and other resources as well. We're also, we have uh, a, a good number of peers, but not as many as we would like. Um, and what we would like to do um, is maintain the integration across both of our clinics. So our OMH certified peers, um, we're looking at the process of getting them SERPA, uh, SERPA certified, which I think is probably a slightly easier process than the OMH process. Um, so we're hoping to do that um, and they'll be uh, foundational to essentially uh, services in both programs. Um, and then just another piece in terms of continuum of care, I should mention uh, again, in our Hartsdale clinic, we have the intention um, and actually the funding to support launching the ambulatory detox IOP program. Um, and so the intention is to allow people to start that process on firmer footing, um, then move into Encompass and um, also inclusive craft um, services as well, care services. And through our CCBHC uh, licensure um, in uh, Mount Vernon, uh, which is the other clinic that's being included in this proposal, we also have uh, wraparound services, including uh, care management, um, and then also a vocational educational uh, support specialist as well. Thank you. Let's take this to a vote. Um, make a motion for the approval of this project. Could I have a second? I'll second. All in favor, stay by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Abstention? Abstain. Abstain, Michael Orth. Michael. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Motion carried. Thank you. We are at project number nine. This is the final project for Oasis. And uh, the applicant is Seth Benko. MDP PLLC, also known as Platinum Recovery Center, and the application is 23.036. They want to become a new provider for OASIS Part 822 Treatment Services, and they are uh, going to serve Queens, the county Queens. Uh, and Jennifer. Take it away. Thank you. Um, Seth Benkel is yes. uh, is proposing to uh, to open a Part 822 OPI treatment service to be co-located in his multi-specialty healthcare practice, Platinum Health, located in Far Rockaway. In addition to the full array of OTP services, Platinum Recovery Center patients will be afforded access to integrated and coordinated system of care inclusive of Platinum's existing primary and specialty medical care capacity. Proposed hours of operation are Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 3 p.m., Saturday, 8 a.m. to 1 p.m., and hours for dosing are proposed as Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 2 p.m., and Saturday, 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. Platinum will offer evening hours based on the express needs of clients. In order to remain flexible, responsive, and person-centered, once they become a operational, the program will continually evaluate and make specific changes to hours of operation um, to accommodate evening changes. Seth Bunkel, MD Queens, Key LLC, is a professional service limited liability corporation, newly established as of October 25th, 2021. There are two owners, Dr. Seth Bunkel, uh, at 90% and Dr. David Molina at 10%. Dr. Benkels and Molina bring more than 50 years of cumulative experience providing community-based medical care in a diverse, underserved neighborhoods. Both are committed to a person-centered, integrated care philosophy. Dr. Molina meets the requirements for S the SUD experience as required by OASAS. The New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and OASS recommended approval of the following contingency with the following contingencies. Verification of the hiring of staff, OASIS inspection and approval of the completed facility, a copy of the filing receipt of the New York State Department of State indicating that the amended articles of organization, including the OASIS required language, has been filed. And, Any questions? And, um, 
in New York City, we have Steve Rabinowitz and Seth Benson with their questions. Okay. I just I just have a question about about Dr. Molina. Any relation to the Molina Healthcare? No. No. Okay. Any other questions? I have a question. Please. Hi. Yes. Hello. So I noticed that um that you and your organization had attempted many times to notify various official community boards yes. and there was no response. Um, you, have, have, you, have, you, have, you have established the relationships with other providers in the area and are there other ways that you're thinking of how you can build your relationship with the community there in light of that sort of, sort of generic sort of response that they don't necessarily, the community board is not supporting the services unfortunately. Right, so we, have, we are integrated in the community, so we have a primary care presence. So Platinum Healthcare offers primary care services. Um, we have an associated lab on site. We have subspecialties that come in and through the office. So we have a relationship with the community already, and we have, uh, we employ people throughout the Far Rockway region. Uh, we have a good relationship with New Horizon Counseling Center as well. Um, so. Throughout Far Rockways, we are a known entity. We support the region. And this model is an integrated model, not only because we see through the patients that we care for that they're traveling, you know, very far to get the services that they need. And this is a crucial service. So we have a good reputation. We're integrated in the community. And this is just another step, you know, moving, you know, um, you know uh, working together with them. In terms of the community board, we made, it, you know, extraordinary efforts, many, many attempts. And all they said was, that there was no reason behind it, so I don't it's nice to see that you're actually that the opioid treatment program is not something aside somewhere else, it's actually integrated into general yeah. medical care, yeah. which I think That's is great. really, really That's important. Great. Right, because so many, right, so many of these patients have so many varied issues, so it is really a uh, inclusive model where a lot of the holistic approach would be great. So, we don't have a sense of why they're saying no, they're just saying. No. <laughs> it's the stigma. It's the dealing of the stigma issue, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? If not, I make a motion for the approval of this project. May I have a second? Second. All in favor, say by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed? Abstaining? Anyone? Motion carried. Thank you very much. And that concludes the presentation for the OASIS project. We are going to move to the OMH uh, projects. And uh, with OMH, we also have nine projects. So uh, the first project is the MH D that 2865 the agency is Hope House on Crotona Park, and they are asking to establish a new uh, program, a community residence, and they are serving Bronx, Kings, Richmond, New York, and Queens. And uh, that is going to be presented by Kelly Devens. Kelly, take it away. Yeah. May I have your attention, have your attention please? Ladies and gentlemen, this is your fire licensing director of the fire command center. This morning we have conducted a CDC social distancing emergency action plan to stay well from immunization drill. For the purpose of this drill, we ask everyone to shelter in place at their workstation and stand by for further instructions. You do not. Everything. You do not have to leave your floor. Do not have to leave the building. Please yeah. show the place at your workstation and stand by for further instructions. Yes. So you own New York City Building will be implemented the emergency action plan under the direction of your fire licensing director. Announcements will be made informing you what has occurred where it has occurred, and why it is necessary to implement the plan. We will then be directed to carry out one of the following provisions of the plan. We have shelter in place. This means you're to remain at your workstation, 
Stand by for further instructions. Do not leave the floor, and most importantly, do not leave the building. By going outside, we put your health and safety at risk. In building relocation, this means you'll be directed to move to a more secure area in the building. And that would be to a center core by the elevator in the corridor hallways. This way, we're away from the exterior part of the building where there's glass. In the event we have a suspicious package, be able to secure you at the building relocation area. Okay. Partial evacuation. This means that only part of the building will be told to evacuate to an assembly area. And full evacuation. This means the entire building will be told to evacuate to an assembly area. Your primary assembly area for this building is on 7th Avenue between 34th and 35th Street. Your open location is on 7th Avenue between 40th and 41st Street. So again, your primary assembly area is on 7th Avenue between 3-4 and 3-5. The alternate location is on 7th Avenue between 4-0 and 4-1. Your final life safety director will announce over the public address which assembly area to report to. Be advised, in the event of an emergency, the elevators will be recalled down to the lobby and taken out of service. You never want to use the elevators in the event of an emergency. We always use the stairs unless otherwise directed. Also, listen to the announcements. If the stairwell has been compromised, we will be directed not to use that stairway. On the ground level, stairway A, which is a fire tower, will take you out to 37th Street. Stairway B will take you down to the lobby. Stairway C will take you out to 37th Street. Again, stairwell A is a the free area. <laughs> Areas of concern may be a natural condition, <laughs> chemical, biological, or hazardous material. Leaving your floor will be improperly directed. It's not recommended. You find my safety direct. Yeah, assessing other waters, deputy waters, and searches on your floor will be assisted with the fire by safety direct. Please follow the directions whenever the plan has been implemented. If there is anyone on your floor that is needed due to a permanent or temporary medical issue, please notify your fire life safety director so arrangements can be made to remove that person off the floor via the freight elevator. Information regarding this plan is available electronically. Please call your fire life safety director to obtain this information. In addition, the management is always ready to assist you with your license. If you have any questions, please ask. Thank you. 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 Yeah, a test I, in the end. My apologies. <coughs> I wasn't expecting this. So I have been trying to move this right along because of the number of projects. So Kelly, back to you. Yeah, I'll try to keep it shorter than that last <laughs> announcement. Um, okay, so Hope House on Katona Park LLC is requesting to establish a 16-bed community residence in New York City that will serve as an alternative uh, to incarceration for adults who have at least one felony level charge and a serious mental health diagnosis. To ensure that this population's unique needs are met, Hope House has partnered with Argus Community, who will establish a co-located continuing day treatment program to meet the clinical needs of the individuals admitted to Hope House. Hope House is governed by the Greenberger Center for Social and Criminal Justice Incorporated, Greenberger Center is focused on reforming the criminal justice system, particularly for individuals with behavioral health disorders, whose involvement in the criminal justice system is often a barrier to recovery. Greenberger Center is a member of the New York ATI Reentry Coalition, and they have received support for this project and developed community linkages with other coalition members, including Osborne Association, Cases, and the Fortune Society. Additionally, the program has received support from the Bronx Community Board. 
New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and OMH have recommended approval with a few conditions which are listed in the summary. Um, Francis Greenberger, Seth Costin, Cheryl Roberts, and Eve Adez are present in New York City and Albany today uh, to answer any questions. Any questions? Uh, I'm sorry, I just, Steph? Yeah, if I can, uh, perhaps, I don't know if it's an OMA question or provider question, but for an awfully long time, there was a real bias around not providing clinical care in the residences. That was people's homes and treatment and other things happened. To them. What's the rationale for co-locating the treatment service in their people's home? Sure. Maybe Cheryl? Um, sure, this is a unique population. It's not been served. And um, we wanted to make it as easy as possible for them uh, to get the services they need. Also, we feel pretty confident that a judge is not going to let them go to a facility where they are have to travel far distances to get their clinical services. Um, and so we are trying to make it as easy as possible for them to have a safe, therapeutic environment. Uh, because this population spends most of their time in solitary confinement or infracted when they're in prison. So yeah. if it were my son or daughter, I'd much rather have them here with a clinic right there than at Rikers or an upstate Agreed. Prison. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. This is a really neat project. It's a neat project. And I congratulate you for offering these services to this population that have uh, been underserved for many years. Thank you very much for yes. doing this. Yeah, I just uh, want to echo Hilda. I, have I just want to echo what you said, Hilda. I, I agree with you 100%. This is a very difficult population. You know, we, we know the trans institutional patients issues. We're very appreciative that something innovative like this is being constructed. Well, I just want to say thank you to the all made staff. This has been an eight year licensing <laughs> odyssey, which I think is very appropriate wow. somehow that that. And you're saying line. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> We're just very <laughs> grateful that because it's new, you know. It's, Any other questions, comments? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I have, Good for you guys, really. Yeah. Yeah. This, is proud. Deb. this is Deb. Just a quick um, question, but definitely um, kudos to, to OMH and, and to the group for putting a project like this together. So well needed. Um, the question I have, I just want to make sure the access flow of patients, this is an alternative um, to folks who will be going to jail so they wouldn't step into jail. But if they are in jail and want to access this program, you know, there's been this dialogue for years about getting folks on Medicaid as they transition out of the jail. Have this crossed your path as you thought through this, this model? Yeah, so Eve, let me just take that for a second. So this is a population that is prison bound. So jail is for misdemeanors up to a year and then prison is for higher level when you're sentenced to a, a felony when you're going to- Okay, so this is you know, jail. No, no so prison. they're gonna start, they're gonna start in jail and we hope to get them out of jail and into our program before they are sentenced Right, so got it. Got it. Any other questions? I just have one quick question. Um, can you talk about, uh, you know, obviously, this has been a, a long time preparing and, and putting this together. Did you engage any um, individuals with lived experience when you were thinking about how to, how to design the project and what did that look like? Yes, actually, and I might turn this to Francis, but Francis Greenberger said uh, he wanted to design this for the client. And his son, his oldest son, Morgan Greenberger, was a client. And Francis, do you do you want to say something about that? Well, um, <laughs> We had spent uh, years going uh, meeting with other programs, clients of other programs, 
a lot of prisons, incarcerated people as well as people that are trying to help them. Uh, and all of that. Thank you. When we had the other uh, advisors and commissions. So there's been a world of input for these guidelines as well as a lot of public officials understood that all this different than what has been done before that um taking uh thank you i uh, want to continue moving right along since we have a lot more projects to look at um so i make a motion for the approval of this project could i have a second second I'll second that uh all in favor say by saying aye aye aye, aye. opposed abstain motion carry project number two thank you very much the project you. number two thank you. is a CPAR, uh, CPAR number 67 and is to reduce inpatient beds and the agency is health alliance hospital mary's avenue campus and they are serving the counties of Oldsburg. And that project will be presented by Amber. Uh, is it Amber Pie Pieco? Pieco, correct. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Health Alliance Hospital, Mary's Avenue Campus, is a non for profit corporation located in Ulster County. They are requesting to reduce their Mary's Avenue Campus inpatient yeah. to 40 to 20 beds. Although this application seeks approval to reduce inpatient bed capacity by 20 beds at the Mary's Avenue campus, a second comprehensive PAR application will be submitted by Mid Hudson Regional Hospital to expand their inpatient psychiatric bed capacity by 20, therefore not impacting the overall 80 psychiatric bed capacity available in the Hudson Valley region. This coincides with Westchester County Healthcare Corporation's plan to create a center of excellence for psychiatric and chemical dependency services at their mid regional Hudson uh, Hospital, which will also be available to Ulster County residents. This application includes required renovations to establish two inpatient psychiatric units out of the remaining 20 beds, which have been offline since the onset of the COVID pandemic. These beds are estimated to be live by May 2023 once construction is complete. Renovations will complete a dedicated 15 bed psychiatric unit with the remaining five beds embedded into an adjacent medical surgical unit reserved for psychiatric surge bed capacity. A deficit is noted in the application. However, Health Alliance will attempt to utilize other existing operating income to fund daily operations and services and to address this remaining deficit. OMH has recommended approval for this application provided a few minor conditions. John Paul Velle and Todd Dixon are present at our New York City location to address any questions the council may have. Any questions? Yes. Uh -huh. yes. Excuse me, I didn't hear that. Questions? Okay, if there is no questions, then I'll take the uh, motion to approve uh this project second see you all in favor stay by saying aye aye, aye. opposed abstentions motion carries thank you very much we're moving on to project number three this is uh project uh mh dash c dash 2869 the agency is a beacon place llc and they are requesting to establish a new program a clinic treatment program article 31 and they are in orange county and this will be presented by rudy areas rudy yes hello and good morning uh Beacon Place seeks to establish an Article 31 clinic treatment program clinic to serve residents of Orange County, New York. 
of all age groups and cultural and language backgrounds. Uh, it will also be available to the nearby communities of Rockland County. Beacon Place was established in 2014 to provide practice, to provide private practice, mental health counseling and medication services to children, adolescents and adults. Uh, Beacon Place has identified service gaps in the community due to the high demand for mental health services uh, of the community currently serves through its private practice. Most often, it is forced to refer individuals to other providers. As an established prov provider in the county, its leadership has developed relationships with local providers and will continue to integrate and coordinate services within the local mental health system. The Office of Mental Health is recommending a um, I do have one thing to correct in the, in the long write-up. Uh, I referenced DOH uh, affiliation, when in fact there was no DOH uh, affiliation. So, um, and joining us today, representing Ryder, is Randy. Any, any questions for the agency? Well, one maybe just a clarification. So you were saying yes. um, uh, earlier that uh, often you had to refer people out. Is that, is that meaning people with Medicaid and license work? Yes, that is my oh, first grade. Yes. If you're talking for straight Medicaid, we, we're, with the group practice we have, we'd be doing fidelity and the managed care Medicaid. But to serve people with straight Medicaid, we needed to go for the elimination. Got it. Got it. Yep. Any other questions? Not motion to approve this project for Beacon Place LLC. Could I have a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor, say by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you. Project number four. Yes. Yeah. Uh, MHA 2874, and the agency is Rural Outreach Center Inc. And they are requesting to establish a new program, an Article 31 clinic, and they are in Erie County. Uh, and uh, Bernadette Mueller will be presenting. <laughs> Bernadette, take it away. Oh, I was good with my last name. <laughs> um, Rural Outreach Center is requesting OMH approval to establish an Article 31 clinic treatment program to serve children, adolescents, and adults in Erie County. The Rural Outreach Center grew out of the work of Pathways Christian Fellowship founded in 2006 by the Reverend Frank Cerny. The group was committed to founding a community outreach program with the church after exploring urban poverty in Buffalo. The group turned to Western New York's rural areas. A survey and consultation with an expert in rural poverty, poverty showed that this population was not just underserved, but not served at all. An evolution of programs and partnerships providing wraparound services began. In any given month, Rural Outreach Center has over 150 active participants. These participants engage with the agency to attend counseling, play therapy, and care coordination sessions. They also engage in a variety of programs that help build their confidence and ability to be self-sufficient. Their five core actions that they focus on are minimizing charity and optimizing empowerment in everything that they do, breaking the cycle of rural poverty by emphasizing early intervention, serving rural populations through wraparound centralized services, collaborating with other agencies to avoid duplication of services, and measuring and monitoring outcomes based on social determinants of health. There's been an increased need for services in rural areas, but a significant decrease remains regarding the availability of services. This is particular, particularly noticeable for children, with many demonstrating more mental, behavioral, and developmental disorders. 
Access to resources is a frequent challenge in rural communities, with a lack of transportation being one of the most difficult to access and provide individuals with means to connect to any services. While the agency focuses on eradicating rural poverty and working with participants to deal with significant traumas in their lives, OMH is recommending approval with conditions and Dr. Cerny and Monique Brennan are in the Syracuse location for any questions. Are there any questions? I do uh, also want to congratulate you because often uh, the rural community goes unserved. So, and there are many agencies that are willing to go out there and start new programs. So, thank you very much. Are there any other comments or questions? Hi, this is, this is Michael. Just a question about uh, maybe I didn't see it, oper uh, hours of operation and day served. And also, uh, does the agency plan on using virtual as well because of the rural area? How do they incorporate or do they incorporate that in, into the clinic services? Uh, yes, thank you for having us today. Uh, yes, we do incorporate um, virtual because of that issue, transportation, um, often. And I'm sorry, what was the first question? First Just in terms of hours of operation. And sure. So uh, hours of operations are going to be uh, 9 to 5 Monday, um, 9 to 7 Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and 9 to 5 on Fridays. We also have contracted with other uh, crisis services and spectrum to provide any crisis services after hours. Thank you so much. Any other questions? questions? Um, yeah, can you talk a little bit about, um, as a family member and, and in Westchester, we do a lot of wraparound. Can you talk a little bit about what wraparound services mean um, from your perspective and what that's going to look like with the families mm -hmm. that you're partnering with? Yeah, we've, we've been offering uh, our services since roughly 2012. Um, and our objective, we, we realized that to address poverty, um, you needed to get out of the silo approach where uh, mental health services are offered one place and housing is offered in another place and, and so on uh, because it doesn't do much good to counsel someone uh, and send them back to a toxic environment so our objective is to surround them with whatever needs uh, they might identify and, and i want to emphasize that that they're the ones that are driving the process so we interview them and they determine what their strengths are what their weaknesses are uh, what their goals are, and uh, then we put them into a matrix where we monitor 14 different goals, uh, which are related both to poverty and, and health outcomes, and we monitor their on those goals. So um, our objective is, once they set their objective, is to identify the resources that they need, and then we work with over 90 other partners and collaborators to provide whatever resources and opportunities they need. Many are are provided within the rural outreach center or, or the rocket itself uh, but we bring in whatever the, the participant th thinks they they need that's even neater because you are providing a holistic approach to services and that is very successful i did it myself uh, so thank you very much any other questions yeah i just have one more question sabina just a question about your staffing um, I fully realize how difficult it is to find psychiatrists and psych NPs. And I noticed you only have a point one of a psychiatrist time. And it's it's great to see that you've got a healthy margin. That that's good. And I hope that really comes to be. So I'm just wondering if that if that FTE was based on some sort of assessment of your sort of understanding of the need for medication management, or is it more the reality of how difficult it is to find psychiatrists or prescribers in the workforce? And if you have any plans to potentially grow, you know, grow the FTEs depending on the need. I, I'm the director of counseling, Maria Hipperbacher, and one of the things that we did was we uh, spoke with each one of our, our participants to determine what the needs are. Many of them have a psychiatrist, some receive medication through their general practitioner, and the, that number was based on what we foresee as the need at this time. And, you know, yes. Thank you. 
And just one other quick question. One other quick question with regards to staffing, and maybe this is um, maybe the rural outreach center as an organization has this, but um, is there any use of family support, family peers within the model when we're talking about wraparound and engaging the entire family? Could you, I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question? Do are you do you have in your staffing pattern? Are you using any um, peer support? Family peers. Yes, we do. We have different programs that. Um, yeah. So, so we, 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 we try, we try to avoid uh, the, the use of the word programs because our objective is to surround them with what we call experiences. Uh, so uh, we have we have a lot of experiences for the kids where we integrate um, the counseling component, the academic component, and so on. Similarly, with the families, uh, we bring families together to provide experiences where they can grow uh, as a as a family, but they also interact with other families and learn from one another. Right. And so those experiences are facilitated by licensed clinical staff or by peer staff. Okay. Because the, the needs, we integrate the needs. Uh, any, are you clarifying that? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, thank you. So I had one last Yes, comment. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, as a licensed clinical social worker myself, um, I guess this is more just a comment. Number one, the approach, um, you know, I second and third the approach to working in the rural communities. And thank you for that. I come from a rural community, I operate in a rural community. I am a little bit concerned when I look at your staff salaries and what you're projecting from a budget perspective that you might be under budgeting for the need for staff salary, the ability to recruit LCSWs, um, folks with, you know, expanded credentials. So that's not a criticism, it's just a comment and a caution. That's what keeps us up at night. <laughs> it's what yeah. keeps all of us up at night. Yeah, that's right. So it's not only their problem, it's, it's everybody's. A lot of problems. So let's take this to a vote. May I have a uh, motion to approve uh, this project? Uh, could I have a I'll second? second? Yeah, I'll second. All in favor, say by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed? Abstaining? Motion carried. Thank you very much. Moving right along to project number five. I got close to half an hour to finish this. <laughs> so, um, thank you for coming. Thank you. Project is MH-B-2073. The agency is Hands on Health Associates, LLC. They are requesting to establish a new program, an article 31 clinic, and they are going to be serving uh, Kings, Kings County. And I believe that Bernadette is presenting that uh, also. Bernadette, take and, it away. Okay, thank you. Um, Hands on Health Associates LLC is requesting only to approval to establish an Article 31 clinic to serve adults in Kings County. Hands on Health Associates operates an Article 32, Part 822 outpatient program that was established in 216 and serves adults with substance use disorders by providing treatments focused on individuals achieving recovery. Many of the individuals receiving services at the agency have a dual diagnosis of substance use disorder and mental illness. All services for the mental health and SUD substance use disorder populations are provided in Kings County. There remains the need for additional services. The 2018 Community Board 5 Health Profile a report that considers neighborhood health indicated East New York and Star City having a 65% higher rate of adult psychiatric hospitalizations than the rest of New York City. It also points to the challenges that residents in the community have more difficulty accessing preventative services and early 
care while having more stressors and interruptions in their health insurance coverage. It also indicates that people with severe mental health disorders have a higher incidence of hospitalizations and premature deaths. The COVID-19 pandemic has created an even larger increase in the unmet need for mental health services. OMH is re re recommending approval with conditions, which are listed in your summaries. And we have um, Dr. Thomas and Edward Wells with the with Hands on Health in the New York City location. Any questions? So perhaps an OMH question it is the most <coughs> efficacious. I don't know where the status is of the integrated care license, but is this the most efficacious way to do integrated care by getting a second set of regulatory oversight on the I think I can address that. So right now, um, OMH, the only way to have that integrated care, integrated health record with OASIS is to have an IOS, um, you have to hold both licenses and then you can apply for an IOS license. So until we are able to revise that, that is, yeah. I recommend the priority provision. That, that, is, um, that is a priority, it's a priority in our budget this year. So, yep, absolutely. Maybe on eight years. Yeah. The, the, goal, the goal is by 2024, so <laughs> it's in sight. Any other questions, comments? Yeah. Any, areas I need. Any other questions? <laughs> not, not, uh, motion for approval of this project, but I have a second. I'll second. Thank you. All in favor, say by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Thank you very much. I got half an hour to review three projects. <laughs> so be nice to me, please. Um, the next project is MH Dutch. D-2875, the agency is the door, the Center for Alternatives, Inc., and they want to establish a new program, an Article 31 clinic, and the counties that they are serving is in New York, uh, and this one will be presented by Woody. Woody, yes, take um, it away. Thank you. So... The door seeks to establish an Article 31 clinic treatment program for young adults ranging in age from 12 to 25 who reside in any of the uh, New York City's five boroughs. Uh, services will be available to individuals from, cultural, from all cultural backgrounds and ethnicities. The program will admit recipients regardless of their ability to pay and will use a sliding scale fee for those recipients without health insurance. The door has been providing services to the young adult population in New York City since 1972, having yeah. determined that alternative and innovative methods were necessary. Uh, hey. Alternative and innovative methods were necessary to address their needs, specifically those in the age range of 12 to 24. Today, the door is a not for profit corporation with, with a staff of about 200, which has received recognition in New York City and throughout the nation for its work with young adults and as a model for success, for successful delivery of services to youth and families. The provider, curr the provider currently operates the Door Health Center, a New York State DOH licensed Article 28 Diagnostic and Treatment Program, which is also designated as a federally qualified health center that, that provides primary health care. Through its uh, services and involvement in the community, the door has identified 400 to 500 individuals in need of outpatient mental health services. A number of these are served in the Diagnostic and Treatment Center, which has reached the threat the threshold of 30% allowable uh, limit. Article 31 certification would allow the door to continue to provide mental health services to participants and to provide a wider array of mental health services. The operator is in good standing with the Department of Health 
any help to my house back in Any questions? We do. Uh, just that we, we have some representatives in the new field office that we met for or like forward. Well, kudos to this agency because they have received all kinds of recognition yes. for the services that they provide to the youth. So that is great. Congratulations. Any other questions or comments? Just just one co comment, if I can make. Uh, just uh, I echo the congratulations. I was also wondering. Um, relation to uh, telehealth and obviously such an integral part of young adult accessing services. And then the other thing is that the mention of the psychiatrist, the board certified, whether or not that's child yes. certified. Um, so just question. Thanks. So for the question of telehealth, I think COVID actually showed many nonprofits that they were struggling with the need to innovate and to do things a little bit differently. And to your point, what we found was that telehealth really provided a uh, uh, built a gap, right? Standing in the gap for young people who are more accessible on their phone. So during COVID, we did provide telehealth. We currently provide uh, telehealth services as well, based on the needs of the young person and their scheduling and availability. So uh, with our Article 31, we will continue to offer that service. And then as it relates to the board certification, we have three psychiatrists on staff. Um, one is board certified in child and adolescent psychology, uh, psychiatry. Thank you very much. Yeah. Any other questions? Quick moment of clarification of the candidate. Is okay. That, okay. Is that yeah. still yeah. the case of three? Yeah. Yeah. David had a question. Crashing yes, from breaking. Yes, that is still oh. the case. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just add, David, if, if you have an IOS license, that threshold increases. There's also some it's additional services that can be provided um, underneath, like health monitoring. Yep, that's great. I don't care. Thanks. Yep. Any other we're questions? We're good here in Albany. Any other questions, concerns, comments? If not, motion for approval of this project. Uh, could I have a second, please? Second. second. Thank you. All in favor, amen. say by saying amen. Are you looking for amen? amen. We'll give you an amen. Amen. <laughs> amen. <laughs> amen. <laughs> amen. So, long of the wings. Very nice for you guys. Okay, so where was I? Uh, all in favor, say by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Aye. Uh, abstain. Uh, yeah, I'll abstain. I'll abstain. Uh, who is that? David Woodlock. David Woodlock. Opposed? If not, motion carries with one abstention. Uh, moving on to project number seven, and this is project CPR, CPAR number 100. The agency is the New York City Health and Hospital Center, Wood Hall Medical and, and Mental Health Services, and they are requesting to reduce the inpatient deaths and they serve uh, Kings County. And this will be presented by Bernadette. Boy, you have been busy. Uh, Bernadette. Um, New York City Health and Hospital Corporation, Woodhall Medical and Mental Health Center seeks approval to reduce the certified operating capacity of the New York State Office of Mental Health inpatient psychiatric program by 23 general adult psychiatric beds, resulting, resulting in a total operating capacity of 89 general adult psychiatric beds. Um, so then their analysis of utilization rate of the inpatient units in Kings County and New York City. I apologize. Requesting the 23 bed reduction. 
in response to the analysis. Um, they're committed to providing outpatient adult services in order to better meet the treatment needs of patients, as well as to complete Woodhull's efforts to avoid preventable hospital admissions or psychiatric experimentation. And OMH is recommending approval, and representatives from the hospital are in the New York City location. Any questions or concerns? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. There are several coming, I think, here from here. Um, first of all, I think I'd like to get a further explanation as to why. I mean, it seems to me that this is antithetical to everything we've been hearing about hospital beds in New York City. Certainly, it's not consistent with the messaging from the commissioner, from the governor, from the mayor. So I, I don't understand why we're seeing this sort of, you know, what we're talking about 23 bed reduction. In, why I don't understand also the, the need for adult and patient bed has declined significantly between 2016 and 2021. I, I don't see that. I'm, I'm, I'm about the community. I think we're all about the community, but at the same time, we recognize the need for hospital beds. And I, I have not noted the decline in the emissions have gone down. I, I don't understand. It seems, again, antithetical to everything we're hearing and, and reading about. So in response to that, we have some data that we're all provided. Yes, at this point, um, the total number of beds in Kings County is um, 751, and then 170 of those are offline. And then Woodhull also, their their rates of of use and stuff like that have they have been functioning with the 89 beds for a while so they're seeing that that it, you know it maintains a comfortable percentage of use and everything like that the length of stay so the data is there to support that and just sort of just i don't know every everything we're hearing about from public policy perspective just doesn't seem to, to make sense you know, you know on one hand the media is rife with articles about people languishing in the yards and can't find a bed and those sort of things uh, I don't know that that means it's true because it's in the media that's there. But that's certainly the uh, feeling I think in the city what? is that people can't get access to information. Uh, are applicants from uh, Woodhull present in New York City? Um, yeah, they're down in New York City. Yes, we are. Yeah. What is the line? We'll, we'll introduce ourselves and then discuss those questions. Great, thank, thank you. Good morning. I'm Lisa Scott McKenzie, the Chief Operating Officer for Woodhull. And I'm Frank Cicero, a consultant representing Woodhull. And I'm Dr. Lino, the Associate Executive Director for Behavioral Health. Um, I'll, I'll start, and, and I think Dr. will will expand on what I have to say. So the, the first thing to, to say is that the occupancy um, in, in Woodhull's units is currently at 77%. So the, the 89 beds have been more than sufficient. And, and the 23 beds that are being proposed for certification here have not been utilized or staffed since 2016. And since around that time, Woodhull has significantly expanded its outpatient programs and has also implemented a CPEP program, which I think is uh, that the article I think that was referenced indicates that the programs that have had trouble have not uh, taken the, the effort and expense to implement CPEP and, and doctor will will discuss that that has been a, a real help here. The one thing that is not referenced here is this unit is going to be used and, and the function has already been approved by OASIS and contingently approved by New York State Department of Health for an expanded and relocated outpatient OASIS program. So it, it will continue to be used for behavioral health, but in a, another area of behavioral health where there's a, a, a greater demonstrated need in the community right now. So we think that's important for everyone to know. And Doctor, maybe you'd like to say a little bit more about the outcomes. Yeah, so I think what, what happened to us, obviously realizing that the non-operational beds uh, were not needed. We didn't have to transfer anyone uh, from the hospital to other hospitals because of lack of beds. I think for us, the game changer was developing an, uh, the CPEP program, which has six uh, extended observation beds. When patients are admitted to that CPEP program, they're staying up to 72 hours 
where we can evaluate if they really need an admission or not. So I think if they do, uh, obviously we do have the beds to admit them. We didn't have to uh, divert or uh, send patients to other hospitals as well. So it's really illustrating that uh, uh, our outpatient programs uh, together with the 89 beds that we have were serving the need of the community, not impact uh, lack of services or negatively. Also, we have an ACT team that also part of the outpatient that has uh, visiting the patients and they see the patients in the community in the heart. Again, uh, they are uh, offsetting the need for admission because they're there right in there addressing the need of the patient on an outpatient basis. We also have the mobile crisis unit, which also uh, serves the crisis uh, patients and or uh, recipients in the community. And this crisis unit, uh, when patient is discharged from CPAC, we're not just telling them discharge and uh, we'll see you in the outpatient. We're following them up, making sure that they do connect with the outpatient. So they have also an extra visit when they are discharged from CPAC. So all those wraparound services really what illustrated that uh, those beds that were taken offline since 2016 uh, would not would not serve as the need uh, that we were not able to do. Yeah, I, I just wanted to make a comment because I firmly believe, and you guys have heard me say this before, uh, I actually think, Glenn, we're, New York State is overbedded. I think there's an emphasis on inpatient. I think the emphasis they're putting here on CPAP's mobile crisis, keeping people out of inpatient and yet providing the level of urgent care that's needed is really the long-term shift we have to go to effectively treat people. Uh, I, I don't think you do people a service. There are many people who need to be in the hospital, there's no question. But people who can be treated in, in short-term CPAPs and can be treated with very intensive outpatient treatment, I think the long-term gain for them compared to putting them in a hospital is enormous. You know, That's been Ian, evidenced I, in yeah. many states. Ian, I agree with you 100%. I'm, I'm totally there. I mean, we're very supportive of that, of course. But it just, I don't know, it just seems to me that people are going into the ER. Are all those people either ending up in the, in the, what, the capacity that already exists, they're ending up in CPAPs. I, I just can't believe it. The crisis is going on in the city right now. And we're talking about, you know, the, the policy changes around adding more beds. And again, I'm, I'm not a proponent of more beds, but in a situation where we're in crisis right now, it just seems to me to make sense that we shouldn't be talking about reducing capacity in the you know, in but, well, in, rea in reality, though, we're not reducing because these beds don't exist. They haven't existed now, as I understand it, since 2016, and they're not at 100% capacity. So I would rather see them get that space to turn it into an outpatient OASAS program than let it sit there fallow. I also want to add that in, in our uh, analysis review of the CPEP uh, visits, only 22% consistently needed admission. So it's not something that their need of admission increased and we didn't have beds. We really are able to provide all the beds that are necessary for those patients uh, that need admission in CPEP. I think CPEP is a bridge that really illustrates and also assess the patient do they really need admission. And as we were mentioned that if we don't need admission, really rather than to serve them, uh, and several the needs on the outpatient basis, which is also helping them to integrate in the community. I think that the, the, the sooner they're back into the community, the better it is. And obviously, as they have the support of community services, that also uh, is good and better. Uh, we, have, are the, we have a question from a community, uh, yeah. committee member in Syracuse. Uh, this is this is Laura uh, Kellerman. I have a question, probably for OMH. Um, you mentioned there's 151 beds in that area, and 170 of those are currently offline. What is the occupancy of those beds that are actually online? What is that percentage occupancy over time? It's, yeah, I don't have that information. I, I think you actually just heard the total number of licensed yeah. beds available. Yeah, it's 700, 751. 51 total beds. 70. 100, of those, how many are offline? 
So yeah, it's like not an opportunity. Doing something else. No. So, so effectively, effectively, there's 581 current beds in the community. Correct. Operational. Operational. And so we don't have information on what the current occupancy is of the operational beds. No, we don't have it handy, but we can certainly okay. follow up and get that. We have, we, we have wood. We have the wood hall occupancy. They they presented theirs. That's that's accurate, but it uh, what's from from where I'm looking at it, if inpatient is a com is for the whole community, if there is a lack of resources, and so I understand that for um, wood hall. Your occupancy has not been at 100%. You said currently it's at 77%. Um, yes. But are the other hospitals at 100% occupancy? Are What's they the at 105% occupancy? Are they the having people in emergency departments that aren't able to transfer elsewhere? So that's my question, or that's the basis behind my question. Yeah, that's a good question. It is very good. I just like to also mention that Woodhall Hospital is part, as you know, of New York City Health and Hospital System, and there are several larger uh, mental health uh, hospitals than Woodhall in the near area, Kings County, for example. And uh, they also, I can't give the occupancy numbers because I don't have them now, but they are not at 100% as well. Um, if there were a need for us to be able to transfer patients between the system <coughs> hospitals, they would have done that as well. So 77 right now represents all of the beds that are needed in our community. I think part of the disconnect, in my humble opinion, is that I think, you know, not there are less, there are more EPs without CPEPs than there are CPEPs. The CPEP does make a big difference. It's more than just the CPEPs, though. It's whether you have this more robust outpatient platform of a CPEP, which has the observation beds and the mobile crisis teams, plus what is your outpatient platform? And I think, and I, I, mean, I don't have 100% you know, sure data to say this, but I think hospitals that have that kind of full breath services, the whole purpose is to not, you know, to try to prevent unnecessary admissions. I think the other part of the conversation, I think, is that we're talking about a very specific bed type, which is acute adult psychiatric beds. And I think the bed issue is more complicated than just, do we need more short-term psychiatric beds? Or do we need to look at different types of beds, whether it's observation beds, whether it's for child and adolescent beds, whether it's more intermediate state type of beds. I think if we're just thinking about acute psychiatric, which is what most of the focus is on, I think in my opinion, the larger conversation is sort of, can we look at the type of beds that are available? Because I think a number of people, and I think you know some of the, some of the stories that we hear not necessarily sure that an acute short-term psychiatric bed is really the answer. I think there's more complicated and more um, sort of difficult, more more complex issues at play than just whether a 17-day hospitalization is gonna is gonna make is gonna make a difference. So that's just my opinion. Okay. I, just for quick clarification, it sounds like what you're thinking about doing with that space is another behavioral health service, yes. an addiction service. It's a substance abuse service, yes. Cl um, clinic. It's a service. Service. Yes, service. it's a clinic so. together with ambulatory uh, detox. Uh, okay. detox. So, uh, again, uh, the ambulatory detox office offset again the need for beds. For some, uh, many of the patients come with substance comorbidity and substance abuse disorder. And they use the inpatient bed, but now that we have we can serve you there, we got right. other readers, we don't need the bed. So it was used at all. Can I can I ask currently what where are those patients going their uh voice that slice the services currently? We have a we have an open uh, uh, um clinic. They come to us. Uh, you're expanding. You're going to expand, expand it and yes. renovate it. So that's paying right. Expand it. Okay, uh, let's let's uh, take this to a vote. A motion to uh, approve for approval of this project. Could I have a second? Second. Uh, all in favor, say uh, by saying aye. 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 Uh, opposed. If I could, I would. <laughs> Abstentions. 
I'll abstain. I'm abstaining. Okay, so two abstaining. Okay. Uh, thank you, motion carry. Uh, thank you. I have thank two you. projects, two of the projects. Project number A, they should be a lot easier. Uh, CPAR number 103, and uh, the agency is North Wells Healthcare, Northern Westchester Hospital Center, and they are doing a capital project renovation. And they they serve Westchester and uh, Rudy areas. Rudy, thank you. Um, so Northern Westchester Hospital seeks approval to renovate and convert portions of the space of the OMA certified 15 bed inpatient psychiatric unit. The scope of the renovations to name few is a quick iteration of the space to provide new patients. Comfort room, new pantry, and two new interview rooms. The project will require the closure of the unit for a period of four weeks while renovations are completed. During this four week period, the hospital has made arrangements with Phelps Hospital to divert admissions to Phelps, to Phelps inpatient psychiatric unit, as well as with other local hospitals. Backup. The renovations cover an area of 3,710 square feet on the third or fourth floors of the, of the hospital building. There will be no uh, changes to existing bed capacity or building inventory. Northern Westchester is an existing 245-bed not-for-profit acute care hospital. The inpatient psychiatric unit has been in operation since 19. 78 and has consistently maintained its certification status in good standing. The proposed renovations will help modernize and update important functions of the inpatient unit and include uh, safety improvements that will bring the system up to date and ensure um, Joining us uh, from the New York City Field Office are also Dr. Richard Catanzaro and David Castillo. Any questions? Any questions? Any disruptions to the patients during the construction? Hi, good morning. Thanks for having us. I'm Dr. Zero. So, disruptions to the patients. Um, well, there will be a closure of the unit. So, what would happen is patients who would need inpatient admission. Would be seen and evaluated in our emergency room uh, and either transferred to Phelps inpatient unit or another Westchester uh, hospital unit, preferably. Any questions? Any other questions? If not, motion for approval of this project. Could I have a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor, say, say aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Abstain uh, abstentions? Abstention, Mike Moore. Hello? Mike Moore. Mike Moore. You're abstaining? Abstain. Okay. Okay, we are project number nine, the last project, and this is um, this is our number 3391, and the agency is DePaul Community Service, uh, Inc., and they are doing, they are requesting for capital project renovation that is greater than 600,000. And they are going to be renovated, renovating their SRO, which is single room occupancy. Uh, and Rudy will be presenting. Rudy? Thank you. Yeah, one minute. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I can do it. So, uh, it's all six approvals to renovate an existing OMA certified 
85 SRO Community Residence Program for Adults located in Rochester, New York. The program known as Edgerton Square is a building in need of the The scope of the project includes uh, the following, just to name a few. Replacement of uh, shower units, mold and water damage remediation, upgrade fire alarm systems, and infrastructure more technologically appropriate equipment. The project will take place over a period of two years. There will be there will not be any displacement of staff or residents while work is completed. Work will be conducted around resident schedules to minimize disruptions. There will be no existing debt capacity. Excuse me. There will be no change to existing debt capacity or building inventory. Post renovations will help modernize and update important functions of the facility some of which had, had not been upgraded since the year 2000. The applicant is in good standing with OMH and we recommend approval. Okay, we thank you. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I have a question. Um, this is John Cassette. Um, just wondering how you plan to mitigate the impact of the construction while the clients are um, Living in the residence, are you uh, moving any out in order to do a floor by floor? Um, I have some experience with that, um, and it can be it can be very challenging. So I just want to understand how you're gonna how you're gonna do that. Most of the work in the resident um, units is minimal, and it can be done while they're out during the day. Um, any extensive work that we're doing is largely to the building systems. Um, hot water in your tanks, and we have a backup in place for that. Um, so we're really not expecting too much disruption for the folks. Great. Any other questions? Matt made a motion for approval of this project. Did I have to get a second? A second. All in favor, say by saying aye. Uh, Aye. <laughs> opposed. opposed. Abstaining. Hey, we did it. It's close on the bike. Thank you very much. Great job, Delta. Now, Great good job. afternoon. Um, Michael will just take this over. <laughs> Okay, so I guess that we are going to take a recess for lunch. Yeah, we're going to take a, so we're going to take a five minute break, but five minutes because we have the commissioners coming up. So okay, five minutes. 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 Okay, great. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep, yep, fine. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna walk us through our updates um, at OA's NAS. Uh, next slide. Um, so I'm gonna talk about our priority area. Next slide. Um, so equity. So equity is definitely an area of priority um, for us at OASAS, and um, I'm happy to report that we recently established our new Office of JEDI, which is Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, and it's led by Carmelita Cruz, and I know that she's on the agenda to speak later today. Um, we have a general email box. Uh, Jedi at oasis.ny.gov that is, you know, for use internally and externally for any issues related to equity. And essentially, you know, this is a brand new office and a brand new position. Um, and so our first sort of task uh, that we are focusing on is looking internally where we are and doing an assessment around equity. And so we have a, a consultant that we're working with um, who is uh, doing interviews with leaders and with other staff in the agency to really just get an assessment of where we are as an agency and then sort of where we need to go um, uh, in terms of, you know, future recommendations. In addition, this is an office that is really important to cut across the entire agency 
um, right? It's not going to sit in some corner somewhere, but it's really going to be integrated into all the work that we do. So integrated into funding, into regulation, certifications, um, credentialing, all programs. And so we're re so we're forming an internal advisory council so that all of the parts of the agency will be represented um, to really ensure that the equity efforts are across the entire agency. Next slide. Harm reduction is another priority. Um, I'm very excited to announce that we just hired uh, 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 our first associate commissioner of harm reduction, Mary Brewster, um, and that was just last week. Um, and we so are now have a division of harm reduction that we will be staffing up. Um, some of the initiatives that that were um, supporting that really that focus on harm reduction include mobile medication units. Um, and so these are units that will go out into the community, provide medication like methadone and buprenorphine for opioid use disorder. This is super important because as you know, you know, opioid treatment programs, for example, that dispense methadone have are highly regulated and particularly for parts of upstate New York, people have, you know, may have limited access to life-saving medication, depending on their geography. Oh, and so God. now these mobile units will go out to that. And so, you know, places that are high risk, like thinking about um, certain sort of, you know, geographic areas, but also certain, you know, coordinating with homeless shelters, coordinating with jails um, uh, to really serve those at highest need. So we have funded 13, of these mobile medication units and each one is funded at, at about 500,000, I think a little bit over. So it's a real substantial investment. Um, we also recently announced uh, our street outreach awards. And so we know that there are many parts of the state in which there, you know, is a confluence of homelessness, mental illness and uh, addiction. And we really want to focus on bringing those people who are most marginalized uh, into services. And so we're, we funded, um, uh, I, I want to say 15 or 16 sites, about $4 million um, to really do street level outreach to provide education, to, uh, to provide harm reduction materials, supplies, and then also to really help link people into services. Um, we had our first New York naloxone vending machine that went live last month. Um, so a new, you know, an innovative way to get naloxone um, out to the community so people can reduce uh, those deaths. Um, and then we also have a series of um, workshops that, and other sort of ways to support harm reduction in the field. So these are sort of ongoing office hours that we have every month. And, and we really invite providers who have been doing harm reduction for years and years to be part of this and to really leverage the strength that already exists in our system so that um, we can then sort of move other programs and move the work towards a much more harm reduction approach. And so I just you know want to say that this is so important as more and more people are dying of overdose than ever before. Really embracing harm reduction is critical. Um, and, you know, we see this at the federal level as well. Um, and so it's a, it's a, you know, for some people, it's what they've been doing for a long time, but for other people in the field, it is a shift, a paradigm shift. And so, um, you know, we want to be there to support, um, you know, moving people along um, to, to embrace harm reduction. Next slide. And then the third real priority is to have a data-driven approach um, and use evidence-based strategies. And so we're working right now on making data um, more robust within OASAS and more readily available and transparent. So we um, have as a posting a new research scientist position who will lead a research and evaluation at OASAS. And so we're sort of building an internal unit to strengthen our data um, analyses and evaluation. Um, we're uh, our plan is to, uh, is to create a dashboard that will be available to programs and to the public so that people can sort of see 
in their communities what's happening regarding overdose or services or who you know uh, what drug is used, being used most frequently et cetera et cetera um, and then you know programs and local governmental units can use these data to really guide their services um, we also are launching a monthly um, addiction data bulletin so that is going to come out the first one is going to be co coming out this month so that's also very exciting it's going to go you know to the public on our website to programs and it's it's going to highlight um, important aspects of the work that we're doing and so the first one is really going to focus just on kind of where we are as a state and then the subsequent ones may focus on for example adolescents or the lgbtq population or the rural areas or etc you know that kind of thing to really again talk about um you know where we are as a state and kind of what we're doing around these specific issues next slide so i want to give some um, updates about our bureaus next slide so in terms of prevention um, we have ongoing webinars in September and October to really help uh, support providers um, conduct um, sort of uh, assessments of their own areas and to really think about how to evaluate also um, the work that they're doing. Again, this is like a really trying to incorporate and support a data driven approach uh, for prevention. Um, we also recently have uh, uh, announced four um, uh, awards for New York City coalitions. Um, and this is to really um, think about a little bit of a, a paradigm shift for prevention around focusing on community coalitions, bringing together various aspects of community and really focusing on those communities that are at the highest risk of um, developing substance use disorders or experiencing overdose. We have a youth development survey that has already gone out and has been completed. Um, the findings will be available early in 2023. Um, and I just wanna highlight a few very important areas on the youth development survey. One area is around cannabis. As you all know, cannabis policies are changing and you know uh, uh, is legal now. And so I think it's important for us to know where we are with youth now and then following that forward, right, to see the impact of the policy changes. And then the second area that's also very important is around um, gambling and online sports betting. Um, again, with major policy changes in this, uh, really trying to understand the impact that these policies are having and so that we can be best prepared to address potential negative consequences of them. Um, we're working with the University of Buffalo and Buffalo State um, on a state epidemiologic work group, um, really focusing on getting, uh, using data that are publicly available to try and understand how communities may be at risk for uh, addiction. Um, so this will also be uh, culminate in a dashboard so that individual communities can look to see, you know, how they um, sort of rank a, a, compared to other communities and and what the actual fat risk factors are for their communities. And so, um, you know, they're using this sort of science behind this and publicly available data, um, having that available so we can target ser services accordingly. And then finally, um, our prevention division is partnering with the Office of the Aging. Um, and a lot of this work is focusing on, on um, safe uh, disposal of medications. Um, so these are deterra bags, which are uh, drug deactivation bags. Um, and as you know, especially older adults have many, many medications and pills at home, and we don't want them getting in the wrong hands. And many people are not able to necessarily to go out and dispose of the pills with the drug tank back days or to the pharmacies. And so this is a way where they can dispose of their pills safely at home. And so um, 100,000 uh, doTERRA bags are being distributed uh, in conjunction with the Office of the Aging to reach uh, older adults um, who, who may not be able to otherwise uh, safely dispose of their medication. Next slide. And I just have to say, um, those doTERRA bags, um, we, uh, when we were at the state fair, and I personally was at the state fair for a couple of days, um, those doTERRA bags, 
at our table were, were like flying off the table. People were super interested in them. And you know, there's really a big need. People yeah. want to be able to get rid of their pills safely. And um, this is a great technology to do that. Uh, in terms of our uh, division uh, for treatment, so we approved our first uh, essentially telehealth only outpatient program. So as you all know, telehealth has expanded during because of COVID. Um, and there are several co companies around the United States that are telehealth only that really focus on addiction. Um, so we just approved this. We're um, closely monitoring what's happening. We want to look at outcomes. We want to look at who's being served, who's not being served. Um, and, and to make sure that, you know, that we're uh, going to see unintended consequences uh, um, as they emerge and, and also to see about how we need to sort of think about regulatory changes with this new way of treatment. Um, we're also very excited uh, that we released our guidance document for treatment in correctional settings. As you know, um, uh, our law that requires all correctional facilities to have medication treatment for opioid use disorder and alcohol use disorder will go into effect next month. Uh, a lot of work uh, has been happening, particularly around methadone, because of all the regulatory challenges. Um, so working with our providers, partnering with the jails and prisons to make sure that we are uh, ready to really be able to offer medication treatment in correctional facilities starting next month. Um, and then uh, last, um, we have new proposed regulations um, that around uh, requiring medication treatment for all FDA approved medications for opioid use disorder and alcohol use disorder for all OASS certified programs. Next slide. In terms of recovery, September is recovery month. Um, so we have a lot of uh, things happening. Um, one of the things that we're launching is um, this 30 and 30 project. And this is a project in which 30 individuals in a 30 day period um, talk about their journey uh, in addressing addiction and what recovery means to them. Um, and so, you know, this is, uh, great opportunity to really address stigma, uh, to have these conversations, to get discussions out into the open and, you know, out from the shadows. Um, and, you know, we're encouraging programs to also, you know, play these in waiting rooms or whatever, uh, to really get the word out. Um, we ha also have a lot of uh, recovery month events and uh, there's a calendar on our website that, that displays all of the events that are happening across the state. Um, we're also, um, we have a, uh, a second round of the media campaign to really highlight the recovery friendly workplace tax credit. And so this encourages employers to employ people in recovery and they get a tax credit for doing so. And then finally, in terms of recovery, we recently announced uh, uh, additional transportation awards um, that we, and we know, you know, transportation are real barriers to accessing services, particularly upstate. Um, and, and so transportation support is really needed uh, for the recovery community. Next slide. So just in terms of communication, we, you know, we're working really hard to try and improve communication between the, our, our agency and, uh, our providers. Um, and stakeholders. And so we um, are doing this with having regular meetings with about 13 groups of providers and stakeholders. Some of those groups are focused on um, uh, services like prevention or recovery. Some of them are focused on geography like Long Island, New York City, or upstate. Um, and it's a real opportunity to have as a pretty small group, real dialogue so that the you know, so that stakeholders and providers are hearing from us about what is new and what is coming up. And then we can hear from those doing the work on the ground about what the issues are. And so real opportunity to provide a two way of dialogue. And so we're in our second round. So we had one round 
of these uh, meetings and we're in our second round of these meetings uh, now. Um, we also have a new sort of uh, new uh, and updated, uh, you know, media uh, um, group here. We sort of organ reorganized our communications and government affairs unit. Um, and and Tracy Collins is the associate commissioner of that. And so as part of that, we, we came up with a new tagline and a new campaign rollout that um, really was launched at the time of the state fair. So you'll see new ads, bulletins, and social media, et cetera, et cetera, really trying to get the word out there about the services that are available in New York State. And again, really trying to address stigma uh, head on by talking about addiction. Um, and so this is just also a plug to remember to follow us on social media, uh, both OASAS and myself, and you know all the new initiatives are announced uh, also on Twitter and Facebook, et cetera. Next slide. So fiscal updates. Um, so we have the workforce workforce bonuses. That portal that's um, led by the Department of Health is live, so that uh, providers can uh, get workforce bonuses. We know it's not perfect. We know it doesn't cover every single uh, title of employee, uh, and we're you know trying to address that in other innovative ways. Um, we have uh, announced a new. Uh, initiative for additional stabilization funding of providers um, that uh, we're still in our question and answer period. And so the applications will be coming in soon. And that's up to $20 million focusing on stabilizing wow. the provider community. Um, as we know, it's been very rough during the last few years. Um, and then finally, in terms of contract updates, so with all of these initiatives, we, uh, in the last several months, have executed almost 800 contracts um, to really get dollars out to the community, to the you know, programs that are doing the work on the ground uh, to really help support and stabilize our system and the workforce. Next slide. And then the last thing is just the opioid settlement funds. Um, so we, you know, we have an opioid settlement fund advisory board, um, and uh, we've actually had six meetings, I think, held to date um, since June. Our next meeting is September 30th. We have a web, a, a page on our website dedicated to the opioid settlement fund advisory board. On that web page are, uh, you know, the calendar for future meetings. They're all um, the all the meetings are. Um, uh, publicly streamed. Um, there's opportunity for public comment, and there's also opportunity for written comment. Um, so I certainly encourage everyone to have their voices heard about how these dollars should be spent. Um, all of the recordings for the prior meetings are also on the website. Um, and thus far, there have been no official recommendations, but the recommendations um, have just sort of started to flow at our most recent meeting, which was this week. Um, so I really, you know, it's a, a real opportunity, these opioid settlement funds, real dollars over the next 18 years. Uh, and uh, I just encourage uh, all to have your voices heard to tell us how those dollars should be spent uh, to improve the lives of New Yorkers with addiction. Next slide. So that's it in terms of the updates. And uh, uh, so thank you. And I'm not sure if uh, we're doing questions now or if we're going to wait until after Commissioner Sullivan's update. We go right to Commissioner Sullivan. Yeah, well, the, uh, Commissioner, if you can stick around for a little bit, then we'll go to Commissioner Sullivan. And I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions. So, okay. Thank you for your presentation. Commissioner Sullivan, from uh, you're, you're on. Okay, great. Um, can maybe it'll be easier. Maybe can you remove the slides from there, just like you did for uh, Dr. Cunningham? You can move the slides, right? Or do you want me to? You have them. Okay. Or do you want me to try to put them on? We're pulling them up, right? Share. Yeah. How do I do this? Ah, 
Okay, you're still sharing the other ones. Okay, so. Okay, okay, now what? <sighs> Okay, now sorry guys. The slideshow. <laughs> and then from the beginning. Okay, we did it. Okay. <laughs> I think we're okay. Okay. Thanks guys. <laughs> okay. Um uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. I'm actually up at the uh, Niapolis conference, and that's why I'm not actually at one of the sites. But and we're getting some technical difficulty, but I think we're okay. So thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure to hear uh, from Dr. Cunningham. So let me just go through. Um, how do I wait? It's not advancing. Um, yeah. Okay. There we go. Okay. Thanks. So I want to just give an update on some of the key initiatives and the three main areas that we're focusing on. I think I've talked about this before are access to services, equity and include equity, diversity, and inclusion and um, prevention. Um, so I'm going to go through some of the highlights of where we are with those three areas. And um, there's a lot more going on. But if you have any questions about other things, please just ask um, later. Um, First is um, the crisis services. I just want to give an update. This has actually been a joint effort between us and OASIS in a big way. But, but right now we're mainly looking at the data from the 988 numbers. And if you look at them, I don't have to go through these with you too much, but if you look at the numbers across the board, it's about a 50% increase in calls to 988 since 988 went up. And that's been consistent in July and August. And we expect it'll stay like that and maybe even get greater. And the other thing which has um, been improved significantly is the entering of the state. That's very important because if you want to be able to really connect people locally, and make sure that they get everything they need, you want to be answering these calls in state, not at the national suicide line. And basically, we're up to 87, 82%, which is great. And then also the speed to answer, even with the increased volume, has decreased. So that's another very good sign in terms of being able to get people through on the lines and make sure that they can call. So, so far, 988 is doing um, really doing quite well. Um, this is just so you can see the number of calls just broke it out from the four. So it's four or 5,000 more calls is really very impressive since 988 started. We've also started, there's also a 988 chat and text capacity, but right now that's um, somewhat limited, uh, partly because people don't know about it. <laughs> I mean, I think that it's perfectly functional. Everybody can call. So we need to get the word out better about the chat and text capacity. Um, but it's there and people are starting to use it, but it hasn't been publicized as much as 988. I think we have to do a better job of doing that so the word can get out, especially for young people, because I think the text option is really so can be very useful and gives a very rapid response. Um, this is the kind of data that we're going to be connect collecting on the contact centers. And one of the issues that people have been interested in is how often, especially um, our um, clients have been interested in, is how often actually calls go from the um, 988 number to an emergency response. And it's very, very limited, very small. We don't have the data yet in New York, but there's no reason to believe that it's any different from the national data. And the national data tells us that about 98% of all the calls to the suicide um, prevention line in the past, and 988 now, all those calls, about 98% are handled um, by the crisis counselor on the phone. And of that 98%, about 75% are really um, handled just on the phone um, in terms of talking with someone, maybe a follow-up call. And then there's about another 20, 25% of that 98% that are actually referred to services. And this is kind of national data. Um, and then there's this 2% who are referred for emergency services. And those emergency services are the calls usually to 911. And about 1% are voluntary. In other words, the individual um, says, yes, I agree. I should, you should call 911 and I, I want you to help me. And only less than 1% are actually uh, any calls that um, 
ask for law enforcement response, 911 response, um, EMS response, separate from um, someone's consent to have it. So those are the true emergency calls where people really um, feel, the crisis counselor really feels that someone needs or imminent, is in imminent danger. So it's a very small percentage. So what we wanted the crisis line to be, which is good, is it seems to be actually working very closely as a crisis counselor line. And that's what we wanted to continue to do um, going forward. The mobile crisis services across the state are growing, and um, with some FMAP dollars, they will be able to even expand them further. Um, we have them now in 50, I think it's 50 of the cities total that we have the um, services in. Um, we're going to be expanding, we'll get them in all 62 soon. Um, we're moving towards the standard of 24-7, 365, but that's still a challenge. The response time is still as well, but it's getting better. I would say that four or five years ago, our response time could be anywhere from, you know, 10 hours or 12 hours to tomorrow. Um, now across the state, it's usually somewhere within 30 minutes to two hours, depending upon the area. And also, um, but not yet 24-7 event response time. In the city, it's running about 30 minutes now um, response time, which is great. And upstate in um, several of the counties, it's even a little bit less than 30 minutes. So um, we're very happy that people are moving this along. We think with the increased staffing that we can get, hopefully, if we can find staff with the workforce, that we will be able to make those numbers even better. And then we're increasingly using um, telehealth as a consultation um, in, on these mobile teams when it's needed. We will also be training the mobile teams in um, uh, both, um, they, they are already trained in integrated care for substance use, but also in um, integrated care for individuals with IDD. Um, developmentally disabled. So I think that those individuals, um, we will also be doing some specialized training so the mobile crisis teams can kind of answer just, you know, a, a wide variety of calls that come in. I don't know why I'm not. So the reason I'm not moving? Oh, okay, I did it again. Okay, crisis stabilization centers. Um, we've awarded nine. Um, they're out there. They are, um, beginning and I think that we're getting close to a couple of them. Some of them didn't have to be much capital or many renovations. So we're expecting some that will be definitely be able to open um, early next year. The um, supportive centers, the RFP is out. We're expecting it back um, in October. And um, when it comes in, after it comes in October, we will then score and award the um, supportive centers as well. Just to emphasize that throughout this uh, the crisis system, we are infusing peers, and peers will be extremely important in the stabilization centers, where every stabilization center will have to have both um, adult peers and family and youth peers, and that they will be there working together with the teens. And there's going to be a lot of training on the use of peers in these settings so that they are used to their maximum. Because I do believe that um, sometimes, even though we have peers in our clinic system and other things, they're often not used in the maximal um, talents that the peers have to offer. So we're going to be developing that. And a big piece of it, <coughs> have a um, peer advisory board. Um, so they are going to be very much involved in working with us um, in the stabilization centers. And we're also, um, my uh, Amanda, um, who's been helping me now with the tech, but we're out at Niapras, has developed, and we're going to be developing an immediate um, uh, uh, customer feedback um, at the center. So we get immediate response from individuals who concerned in the crisis centers as to whether they've been helped, they haven't been helped, they think it was friendly, they wasn't. And the kind of thing you often see in um, hospitals sometimes or in um, uh, your doctor's office where at the end of it you say, how was my visit? And, and so we're going to be having those in the crisis centers so we get immediate and quick feedback. And then the peers are also integrated into our um, youth act teams, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So homeless outreach, just an update. Um, our teams are out there. We have the safe option support teams are moving along in the city. This is just some of the um, numbers of the homeless on the streets in, in the city and upstate. The safe option support teams, we have them fully operational in the daytime. We're still struggling with getting evening and weekend staff, but they are out there working. We also have an additional 500 housing units, and we're probably going to use those for some transitional housing. Um, that can help individuals move from um, the street to something that is um, a very comfortable and welcoming, which is a big issue. When you actually work with the individuals um, 
with serious mental illness on the streets, it's not so much that they don't want to go somewhere. They want a single room. They want to be by themselves. And they want it to be safe. And they want it to be welcoming. And they want it to be something that's their own. And you know, when you think about it, who wouldn't? You know, um, we ask individuals on the street to go into these big shelters or even into our state places, which are often congregate with maybe four or five people in a room or, you know, sometimes more, even though they might have their cubicle, they have a cubicle. So I think what we're looking at is trying to get, um, we talk to the clients again and ask them what they want and need. And I think we will be able to get some transitional housing, which is more suited to helping people come off the street. Um, this is the safe option support teams. This is just their, their logo. And this is the 10 operational teams. Um, we've already had about 1,600 um, outreach encounters. Uh, we read a number, number of referrals and we've been successful in putting some um, The other thing, because people often ask, there was a big, um, when these teams were started about the concept of perhaps uh, moving people um, involuntarily. We have not moved anybody involuntarily. Uh, basically those who have left, who have moved, left the streets to go to housing or if they've gone to an emergency room because often because they were had a physical problem it's all been voluntary so we have not had to yet use um what we call 508 designation which i think is um, really good news youth and family services i'm not going to go through this list but i put up a big list just to kind of emphasize the investment that's going on in community services for um youth. And the two big areas are the home-based crisis intervention. We've already seen a lot of positive feedback from the communities and the SCOLAs and everybody else about home-based crisis intervention teams that we're starting up. And two of those teams will be focused on working with the dual diagnosis um, developmentally disabled youth and with mental health issues. And uh, we're getting some consultation advice on what those teams should look like and how what kind of training people will need. But we're very excited to help with what I think probably everybody is struggling with, which is sometimes these duly diagnosed youth getting um, stuck in emergency rooms or um, on pa pediatric beds in hospitals because they don't have the kinds of services that they need. So we're doing that. We are also will be on the GD side opening the unit in um, SUNY upstate uh, for kids that is still slated to begin um, probably by spring of next year. And that will be um, statewide for individuals for youth who have mental health and substance use problems who need a really very intensive consultation, which is often what these youth need, and then a good treatment plan. And then we'll be connecting with them step down services. And then some of that still has to be negotiated and worked out with budget, but uh, we will be doing wraparound and step down services. I just wanted to also highlight um, this is just the numbers, just to, so you can see that it's actually happening. These expansions, the dollars are out there, things are growing. Um, and um, unfortunately, right now, there is a crisis with kids being in the emergency rooms. Um, we're working very hard to get those beds opened up that were closed during COVID. And we're putting out these services. The biggest link, the biggest difficulty with some of the services we're putting out is workforce shortages, which everyone knows about. I do want to emphasize the ACT Youth Act teams, because we put these up, um, 20 of them statewide. And the Youth Act teams are really um, going to, I think, make a significant difference. We have a couple that are already working. I visited one on Long Island, and they're already taking um, referrals and are already beginning to have an impact. Um, they, one referral was straight out of an emergency room. Um, another yeah, referral so was exposed. Yeah. So the really the uh, Act teams, I think, have a great potential yeah. to serve on the communities. And if it works, we can then expand further. So we have 19 awards are out and one's in procurement. So these will be happening. And hopefully within the next six months, we'll be seeing these on the ground in terms of serving um, serving the youth, which I think is really exciting. Um, I just want to emphasize this a little bit because we don't often talk about it too much, but I think that the core service array um, that we have and um, all the work that's being done on designating core providers that can provide really um, substantial recovery services for our individuals um, with serious mental illness. And, you know, I'm up at Marathurst and someone just, um, uh, one of the peers who works in one of our clinics just stopped me and said, you know, um, he does this work. He does some cognitive work for skills trainings up at the clinic that he's connected with and that he works in. The clinicians don't really understand this. They don't kind of push forward the opportunity for individuals to get employed, to grow, to become more included in the um, uh, in their communities. We're still a pretty heavy medical model in some ways, so we have to be careful here. And I think this is giving us the opportunity to expand. 
and, and along with that, we're doing a redesign of prose. Prose has not uh, fulfilled um, the hope, which we started with prose, that it would greatly improve um, employment among um, clients. It kind of hasn't. We're running at about a 19%. <clears throat> Which is not so good. Um, so we there are uh, evidence-based practices that have been more successful with employment, and we're going we're looking at those, and that will, will probably be part of this redesign. But the redesign is also going to be done with the input from the um, clients who are receiving the services. So peers and others will be a big part of redesigning the pros and the clinic to rehab option. This is something which OSIS has had for a long time, and we learned from them just how much you can do with this. So we do now have the rehab option, and peer services will be paid for. But we have to get our clinics um, to be able to uh, really embrace this. And that's why we're going to be sending out um, some individuals to work with the clinics so that they understand better vocational opportunities, things that can be done with our, work with our clients. And that's our, a major focus on employment. Um, you know, when you look at the data, uh, one of the biggest um, things that can thwart long-term disability is um, education and employment. And um, we just are not robust as we should be. So we are continuing to work on this. I'm not going to go through these in detail, but basically there's a major push to um, really get um, employment opportunities out there to the large number of individuals that we do serve, but sometimes are not aware or afraid they'll lose their benefits if they begin to work. And that is really not the case anymore. And if you can really gradually work, you can keep your benefits, um, et cetera. We just need to get the clinics and the staff and the, where the majority of our clients connect to understand this and work with them on these issues. So, and then work with other state agencies on employment, work with the Department of Labor, Access VR. They work with all kinds of disabilities, but uh, we're working to enhance their connection to us. Now, equity, diversity, and inclusion, again, very similar to OASIS. Um, you can't do this in any one single way. This has to be something that gets embedded into the bones of an organization, and it takes time to do that. So we've started, um, we've done a bit of a self-assessment, um, and we've also now, uh, for example, our RFPs include equity components that are being looked at very closely. Um, we're looking at all our policies to make sure that equity is a part of the policies that we do. Um, we do lots of trainings and seminars with our providers on equity and inclusion. Um, and we also have a pipeline, we've now started a fellowship pipeline on diversity that um, we will be working with SUNY and CUNY to um, attract um, diversity into our workforce. And then we have launched our vital signs dashboard. Um, and I'll just can't see it, but that's what it is. It's got a lot of dots, and lots of things. But basically, what it means is that the heat is, um, uh, indicators, which um, include things like readmissions, which include things like hospitalizations, um, whether or not um, someone with schizophrenia is hemoglobin A1C is controlled, whether or not you're engaged in. Um, treatment for depression um, for how long and whether or not you have an appointment visit after hospitalization, all those kind of indicators. We have now broken down a series of them, some of them into um, uh, race and ethnicity across our clinics and across our system. And we're giving this dashboard out. We've worked with it already in the state system and come up with seeing some of our issues and started to try to do corrections. And now it's available to all the clinics across the system to see how they're doing and that they can then work with us and our, they can work with them on their own to kind of make sure that if there are inequities and I think they're going to be there. We've seen it in the state system in terms of big inequity is in the connection to primary care and also an engagement. So, you know, you really see it in the data and it makes a difference in terms of, and then you can figure out how to solve it. So this will be expanded, but right now these are the measures and it's out there and um, we're going to be getting feedback from our um, providers about how useful they find it. They find it, but I think so far, the feedback's been very good. And we're doing it really to help, individual, help the individual provider system think, you know, where are we not engaging people appropriately? What are we doing the way we, we, we don't engage our black and brown communities, et cetera. We'll also, we need some specialized programs, and these are just a handful of what's there. And one is an Asian mental health work group, which we started in the city, which is going to come up with recommendations to help the um, work with the Asian community with the stresses they've been under, especially combination with COVID and other things. Um, the Buffalo uh, community, we have got, we were successful in getting a surge grant, I think it's about $2 million, to do some really grassroots work in the Buffalo community. We've started something called Sabana Healing Circles. This is a um, virtual healing circles, which we're funding um, a group of black psychologists who have done this work 
uh, to have available to black communities all across the state to um, just join and talk about the experience of um, racism, the experience of um, uh, experience being discriminated against, et cetera. And if this works, it could be a model for a lot of other um, outreach that we could do similarly across the state. Um, Cares Up is something designed to work with um, support veterans, first responders, and we're doing that with the Department of Veterans. And then there's some work being done in schools that's focused on adolescents, on social emotional learning, um, et cetera. So just on prevention, we're continuing our school-based clinics. We got 1,100. We want to probably try to do another 200 this year. Um, Healthy Steps is expanding. We're having our suicide prevention conference as we speak. I think it's, yes, today, we're the third day. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because our suicide, we've always done suicide prevention conferences and we've done them um, in person. But the last two years, um, we've done them virtually. And um, when we used to be able to get maybe 300, I think we're up to like seven or 800 people who've tuned in on you know, virtual. So it's interesting, you know, I think we have to think about maybe sometimes doing things. We want to all get together and be in conferences, but the reach can be so far with virtual. So it's something just to think about as we try to um, do educational things across the state. Um, I, we are doing extensive suicide. And then I just need to say Project Hope, which has been probably now it's about six, a year and a half, a little over a year and a half, um, in terms of either brief counseling, group counseling, um, has touched um, over a million New Yorkers in terms of working with them on their um, depression, anxiety, worries, concerns, issues relative to um, uh, the pandemic. And um, while sadly, um, human doesn't, doesn't pay you for an evaluation, so you can see, I think what we are hoping is that that kind of touch across the state will have an impact on what um, the long term of decreasing um, depression and anxiety post this pandemic. A lot of it was done with schools, a lot of it with youth. Um, it gave us a firsthand experience when you had this kind of massive um, workforce. We had at one point we had about 800 um, counselors across the state doing this work, um, just how much the communities want it and need it. So we're going to try to continue it um, on a somewhat smaller scale. The FEMA grant was 100 million, so a lot of money. But we're on a smaller scale. We're going to be continuing it in the areas of greatest need um, in terms of continuing that kind of grassroots community outreach and prevention and grow it slowly over time. Um, it's something that um, we have not done, I don't think, as much in, in mental health, which I think is critical. We've done a lot of suicide prevention, um, and we, we can, should connect that with this. But I think we need to do this overall prevention in the underserved communities. So we'll be extending some of that. On track, we'll be increasing. On track is working. Still has great results for um, uh, individuals staying in school and being employed. And we're going to continue to expand it. Uh, one couple of quick quick um, CIT will be continuing. We've now got it into um, 28 McAfee workshops were completed with sequential map, and we have 30 counties that have gotten some training in CIT. We would prefer that everybody call 911 and that we eventually have a Google crisis outreach, but we also know that law enforcement will be called and it's important to train. Um, this is just a good thing that we started and um, it's working with um, three counties. We're going to be expanding it to 20 counties where basically um, the police or the sheriffs, and this is very helpful in the more rural counties, when they go out to see someone, they have a, an iPad that can connect back to a live clinician. And that live clinician is available to talk with them, or to talk with the person they are seeing, to do an intervention right there and on the ground. And in some places, um, our communities, for example, have social workers go out or they have people go out first responders. But with the workforce shortage and with the rural areas where I don't know that we're ever going to be able to get to that, this method seems to be helpful. And basically the um, sheriffs and the other people who use these have felt that it's been very helpful. So we're going to keep an eye on it. We're going to do an evaluation of it. But I think it could be one of those exciting uses of technology going forward. Um, and then just one last is um, in our correctional facilities. Um, this is something that we've been working on for a while with docs. And I have to thank docs for um, working with us on this is to have peers that's um, incarcerated individuals um, who are trained who then get supervision who work with um, their fellow incarcerated individuals and they work with them um, especially around um, individuals who've been in mental health crisis individuals who have been in suicide crisis we have it at four prisons we're going to be expanding to five and if it's successful um, we will move it just those who have um, a crisis 
um, coming out of our crisis services in the prison to the general population. Um, and now that it seems to be working in those um, prisons that have liked it, they want to actually expand it into the just um, dealing with um, any kind of crisis that comes up, even in the general population, which is terrific. So I think that this is a really, this has been a model that was out in Rhode Island, did, did great work with it, and I think it's really exciting to be doing it in ours. Workforce, we all know pretty much what we're doing as much as best as we can. Um, you know, there'll be a lot of talk about this at budget. We expect lots of advocacy. Um, but um, we are working on the pipeline. We're working on trying to come up with um, fellowships and, and doing some joint work with um, um, uh, SUNY and CUNY. And um, we also um, are doing a lot of training. And Project TEACH now also, which remember that's a mental health for pediatricians, is also now I'm on Project TEACH child um, adult psychiatrists and child psychiatrists to work with maternal mental health. Um, and to work with um, psychiatrists who are sometimes reluctant to prescribe during um, uh, um, pregnancy. Um, but there are drugs that can be relatively safe and be used and sometimes are needed. If you look at the maternal health report that came out from the Department of Health, um, there were several cases of maternal deaths um, due, by, due to suicide. And I think that we really need to look at some of them had, had medications that were not recontinued um, because they were. Um, breastfeeding under, there's ways to deal with this and i think that that's a lack in the field of understanding it so we're working on that and then also uh, a special expertise on youth, uh, youth and adults with developmental disabilities and then housing is continuing big time good news here is 500 additional housing units for the street homeless and i'll stop there they've got them out of this thank you thank you thank you commissioner thank you both commissioners we really appreciate it i know you know, if, if you both have time for a few quick questions, can you hear me? Commissioner Sullivan, no. can you hear us? Yes, I can hear. Stop sharing. Okay. Yeah, just want to get rid of this. Uh, so, yeah, so I will thank you again. Thank you both very much. It's very comprehensive, from both ends, certainly very impressive what both agencies are doing. Um, I just have one quick question. Uh, I'm not going to ask about workforce or COLA, even though you are here in Amos of the room. I won't say what <laughs> we're about that right now because I've been talking about that for a million times in the next six months. Uh, my, my question is about, for both commissioners, it's about the impact of what you're going to be predicting about the 1115 waiver. Uh, we were just, we were disappointed that there was not enough about, frankly, substance use or mental health in the 1115 waiver. So we put our comments in and we added our comments, but we, we look at this as possibly a comprehensive way to sort of get additional funding for prevention for data analysis for all the service structure pieces so if both of you could kind of comment on that a little bit just sort of your vision of how we can utilize 1115 waiver effectively oh go ahead Ed. i'll go first <laughs> is that okay yes 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 i think there's a real opportunity here and i think there's a couple of areas that we have to pay a lot of attention to one is um, these, you know, everybody, if you know them, there's these heroes, right? The heroes are going to be these regional health organizations. It is critical that mental health come together, the mental health local providers, get themselves in the governance of those organizations. And I think that I would suggest that we think about, and people can put this together, almost a coalition of, you know, our county uh, people, our providers, our mental health associations, coming together and being a force of a voice um, on that governance. So the one, there's two, that hero is a planning agency. They are not going to be distributing the money, but they are the planning agency and they will be making the recommendations to the Department of Health, as far as I understand this thing. And then the Department of Health will decide which ones to accept and how to flow the dollars. Some dollars will go to managed care organizations, some may go directly to providers. That isn't entirely clear in the first schema of the waiver. But these hero, the regional um, the, uh, this are very important. The second is the social determinants of health. That's another planning group that's also getting dollars for infrastructure. And mental health should think about being involved in those too, the local providers. What's critical here, I think, is that, I hope I'm not talking too fast, we have to start thinking about this before the waiver comes out, guys. I think you have to start thinking about, I would suggest everybody read that document. I read it the other day. It's, it, it, it can get to you. It's long and it's cumbersome. But when you read it, you begin to understand what they're talking about. Two planning groups, 
the planning group on the social determinants, the planning group in the heroes, which will incorporate some things from the social determinants. And then the third big bucket is finance. And the big thing here is value-based purchasing. So, for example, one of the things which we actually got in there was the concept of a bundled payment, perhaps of some form, for um, wraparound services for someone discharged from a hospital or someone discharged from an um, emergency room. And wraparound bundled services for people with crossover diagnoses. What plays most of our providers the most is often these adults and youth with, for example, DD and mental health stuck in hospitals that you get calls about that you can't do. This waiver can offer that opportunity if our voice gets heard. It can offer the opportunity to talk about some funding mechanism that will once and for all break down some of the barriers between agencies because it's a waiver and because it has some potential to do that. So I think those are the big things I would recommend paying attention to the governance of the heroes. And in there, it talks about setting up some you're going to have to push for a behavioral subcommittee and make sure I think the right sub people get on the subcommittees. <laughs> so there's the, the heroes and their subcommittees, the planning people. Then there's this concept of value-based purchasing, and I think our BHCCs and others have already started to do, um, do some of that. I mean, behavioral health, not the not the clinics. The, the, I, I always forget the acronym, but our IPAs, our behavioral health IPAs, they're beginning to do some of this. They should come forward. But I do think it's going to be important to be united on a couple of key issues that you want to push, because what happens when I sat through district. Um, we said a lot of things, there should be money for mental health, there should be money, but you don't get it if you just say that. You've got to come up with the things that are most important. So I would really encourage people to be thinking about that so that you can go get on the governance boards of these things and then say, this is what we as a group are pushing for. Because if the, we, you're going to need a strong voice because there's going to be a lot of people who are going to want the money. My understanding from the waiver is that about $6 billion will be um, going to services on the, on the $13 billion waiver, about $6 billion will go to like value-based purchasing arrangements, which would be probably direct services. The other $6 billion is the mixture of training, workforce stuff, which we should also be involved in, planning, um, uh, some money to the, the um, social determinants groups, the CBOs, because uh, for infrastructure, which um, they desperately need because they've never had infrastructure. So that's my thumbnail thing. But I would really suggest there's also a section on criminal justice, which you should read too, which has to do with um, very powerful. Yeah. So I would just suggest that you really look at it. And we have to come together and be a voice in the governance of these regional bureaus. That, that was a great answer. Thank you. Um, yeah, I like the criminal justice stuff, the 30 day around Medicaid. I think point but yes that's, that's, that's really good advice thank you for that and I hopefully you know when the time comes that there'll be a role for you know the council too in, in terms of the web yes. planning so nice. you know I think there could be a role for us to be talking about that but thank you for thank you for that commissioner uh, commissioner Cunningham do you have a uh, anything I, mean, to I, add or? I don't really have that much to add because you know I think definitely agree with commissioner Sullivan in terms of about in terms of being involved in the in the governance, I think, is really critical. Certainly, the criminal justice issues are super important for us. The social determinants of health as well. So, I mean, I, I think that there, you know, that sort of involvement in these areas are are totally critical to the work that we're doing. Um, but I but I would just echo exactly about the sort of involvement of behavioral health in the governance of in these areas. Thank you. Um, <laughs> we have time for a, a few questions. I know, and I appreciate both of your time. Giving us a little time here. Uh, do other questions anywhere? Anybody have any questions? I I have uh, a question. Uh, yeah, for Commissioner Cunningham, uh, you talked about crisis uh, mobile crisis units, more in upstate. Where where in upstate? <laughs> Um, so, uh, I think, uh, so what I mentioned was that we're funding mobile medication units. Yes. Um, okay. So for, um, so we've had a couple of different, uh, rounds of, uh, RFPs. I want to say we've had three rounds of them. 
Um, and there's so the, the most recent one was just announced a week ago or so. And so and so I want to say uh, I think it's 13 different uh, mobile medical medication units that have been funded. Um, right. I don't have, you know, I don't have the list off the top of my head of exactly okay. where, but it's a mix between New York City and and upstate. But we can certainly get get that information to you. Okay, to thank the, you. Know, we'll, we'll cancel. I know David had a question. So good afternoon. So um, maybe two questions. One sort of a conceptual, and and then one uh, a, a granular uh, one, uh, perhaps for you, um, Dr. Sullivan. Um, on the conceptual one, the, the, it's it's probably early, uh, but I'm sure as you both know, the um, prevention task force at HHS just came out with that recommendation that every adult uh, under the age of 65 be screened for <clears throat> anxiety uh, as part of their primary care. And that comes on the heels of, uh, I think about three months ago, of uh, the same organization uh, recommending every uh, youngster be screened for anxiety. So just, I know uh, early on, are there any uh, preliminary thoughts on, uh, on a public policy to support that? I think you're on mute, Ann. Um, sorry, all the collaborative care work that we've been doing, we've been trying to push increasingly to screen, not just for, you know, depression was the first one out of the box in, in terms of mental health and screening for depression. And then there was expert screening for depression, substance use, and now there's anxiety. And probably the three, the most critical ones are depression, anxiety, and, and SUD. So um, I think that those are the ones we should be doing, but, you know, it got kind of changed so the people, do one screening but not the other. When you say public policy, I mean, it's certainly best practice and it's been um, pushed a lot with the collaborative care. I don't know that, um, uh, you know, it, it would be up to a variety of people if you want to come forward and propose things like, you know, mandating it. We never even really had to finally mandate the depression screening, except for maternal screening that had to be paid for. But um, most um, primary care practices have picked it up. So when you make it easy, for them to do, I mean, in terms of the screening, and then you give them the resources to be able to follow up. They really tend to respond. But I agree with you. Um, we, we we're, when we're doing our collaborative care now, it's not just depression screening; it, it involves thinking of anxiety disorders, and you know, and um, screening also for substance use. The other, sure, we all know the whole the dialectic around we can screen, but if there's no place to send anybody, um, yeah. so what? And then and then you get a reticence on the part of a lot of uh, primary care docs. If, if I I don't want to ask if I can't do something about it. No, but I do think that the big issue here, I think that there's a creative way that you can use um, telemedicine to be helpful with this in the primary care practices. And I think that we're we're beginning to look at that, and I think we should work with them on that. You can have consultations very easily, you know, relatively easily um, in primary care practices with um, uh, something like we're doing almost for Project Teach for uh, pediatricians. We're thinking of doing as a collaborative care initiative for adult um, primary care doctors to call and say, I have this person with anxiety. They do some training, they understand some things to do, but they need some consultation to understand what the next step might be or how to handle it. Um, and that can be done. That can be done, and it's not impossible. So I think that's one of the things we're looking at in terms of making it easier for primary care practices to kind of get involved in this. Um, and then there's the issue of on-site work, you know, working to have the ability for someone to do some of this work in the practice versus always referring out, because the referral out tend to not, unless they meet the person there first, they tend not to work as well. So we're, look, we're looking at that. It's worked very well with depression. There's no reason to think it wouldn't work. The, the granular question, then, um, Dr. Sullivan, um, what's the what's the current thinking around uh, inpatient capacity, particularly uh, in New York City? There's certainly been an awful lot in the media lately about the, the, the backups in emergency rooms and uh, uh, and the like, and access to, to inpatient care, uh, and yet we get presented from time to time with uh, bed closures. Well, let me just say that it, there's two groups of beds, okay? There's state hospital beds and there's city hospitals. The beds in the voluntary system and beds in the, um, well, I mean, the not-for-profit system and then beds in the um, 
public sector in the city. City beds, separate from state beds, are still almost 500 down since the pandemic. That's a major hit that we're experiencing. We're working very closely. Some of the hospitals have good reasons for those beds being closed. Some don't have such good reasons for beds being closed. Both in hospitals has a really very good plan to be coming out with rolling back, um, putting back online the beds that were closed during the pandemic. Some of the other hospitals were struggling with to put those beds back online because our services are not as financially um, uh, lucrative as some other services are. So that, that's the, let me just say, I think before we start talking about more beds, we should be talking about the ones that we've lost during the pandemic and getting them back up. That's number one. Number two, on the state side, we have not closed beds in three years in New York City or the rest of the state. We haven't, we haven't been closing beds. We're not closing them anymore. Um, and basically, yes, we are working very closely on the state side, a combination of things on, on, on opening up some capacity by moving some of our clients could really go into the community a little faster into the community than the state system does. <clears throat> the other piece that you always have to consider when you're talking about beds is are you going to invest in beds or are you going to invest in community services? To some extent, we have more beds than just about any other system in this nation or the world, to tell you the truth. We have a lot of beds in New York State. The question is, are they being used the right way? Um, we have a lot of clients who come back multiple times to those beds because in some ways we're not wrapping the kind of community-based services. So determining the number of beds is not an easy calculation because, and, and people have tried to do this, you know, how many beds per capita? It depends on what you've got in the community. And if you have a lot of community services and a lot of easy residential, residential, which we still are struggling with, we don't have easy residential beds. Maybe you don't need as many inpatient beds. So long, short story though, the first thing we have to do is get those offline beds up. And that's something that we're working on to make happen. I mean, 500 beds down, it's still 500 beds down across the you know, city. Upstate equivalent number, maybe 350 down across upstate. But that's it's still like 800 beds that we've lost. They're still not back since the pandemic. And that turn over many times a year. So that's a lot of is a partly discriminatory phenomenon. I'll give my one last soapbox. They basically, if you notice, the bed surgical beds are back up. And if you notice, the surgical beds are back up. And hospitals are dragging their heels on putting back psych beds. So we need all the advocacy we can get out there for the, for the hospital, community based hospitals to put those beds back online. Spot on. Thank you. <laughs> I know I'm not supposed to editorialize, but spot on. <laughs> <laughs> we, I think, I Glenn, know. we know what you want to say, Glenn. We all I'll know what you want to say. I'll I'll keep don't worry. Don't worry. You can be discreet. Keep your mouth shut. Exactly. <laughs> uh, we have time for one more question. Can I just, Sabina, can I just more of a comment and a suggestion, going back to the waiver, actually, where we started. So um, just two things for consideration. I think in large part, the whole, I think it's called NIDER or something like that, right? It's really focused on, quote, various vulnerable populations. And I think the thinking was is that people with behavioral health conditions fall under, you know, this sort of group. And I think what there's two things that may be sort of helpful to think about in the granular design of the waiver is, is that those heroes, so there is um, a plan for the, that these heroes will be regionally based, but in New York City, it's not clear exactly how they will be organized. And one possibility is rather than focusing on a borough by borough hero in New York City, could we have a behavioral health <laughs> hero, right? Something like this, so that it's not just regional. Um, and then the other piece I just want to highlight, and no offense if there's any managed care folks here, but I think uh, yeah. part of what <laughs> 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 well, you're, you're tired. No, 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 no. <laughs> so part, part of that, we just want to make sure that all managed Medicaid plans um, get involved in EBP contracts for behavioral health populations. That has not been the case. And I didn't I don't think there was necessarily sort of a Requirement for all managed. I mean, they have to get involved in BBP in various levels, but I don't think there was something specific to state that they need to uh, engage in contracts with that. So, so those are just two suggestions. Who would love to? Then, if I can just add, that's why it's so critical to be in the governance because that's what's going to determine that that push to the managed care companies, for example, are you're absolutely right. 
to engage in value-based. The other thing is, you know, counties can um, be um, the zero organization. It's in the small print, but it's there. So for example, New York City DOHMH could, um, Erie County could, um, Westchester County could, just to keep it in mind, um, you know, the, in terms of coordinating the whole thing, which would be interesting in some places, but it's there. It says local governmental units could be. Well, thank, I know or appreciate your time. I know you stayed past time. So thank you very much, commissioners. We really appreciate this. Very informative. Thank you. And uh, appreciate it. Thank you. And thank, thank you guys you. For, for all you yeah. do. Really. Thanks. Thank you for, for being on the VH staff well, and doing such good work. Thank you. Bye. We're going to take, everyone, we're going to take a five minute break. We're going to take five minutes. <laughs> Use order of businesses for a few minutes. We can take a minute or a few minutes. <laughs> Glenn, I just want to, for a point of order, my last name was spelled incorrectly on the minutes. Okay. So it should it should be all E's, K E L E M E N. Okay. Thank you. Happens all the time. All right. So if people have had a chance to review. Um, I need a motion uh, to approve. Uh, I need a second. 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 Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Okay. So move. Minutes are approved. Um, so now we're going to go on to the, well, we heard from the commissioners, and now we're going to go on to the project review and I know that Hilda and Michael are going to share the responsibility. And Hilda, I just want to thank you and acknowledge the great job you did this morning. You really did a yes. wonderful job. Thank you so much. Yeah, to get us on two hours. Yeah. So thank you. So we're gonna. I I'm not sure if it's going to be Michael or Hilda who's going to go next uh, to talk about this. I think Michael, you're you're going to talk about this. Going to lead this yeah, discussion. Yeah, I'm. I'm I'm Great. ready to, to move forward. We have 18 projects, nine from Oasis, nine OMH. So if I do my math right, that leaves me about a minute and a half per uh, project. <laughs> um, and Glenn, that includes we do a, we do a full uh, committee uh, council vote, correct? On each project. <laughs> yes. right. And that doesn't so I'm gonna do Woodhull. It. Don't forget Woodhull. That's going to be one. Yes, yes. All sense. right, so I'll, I'll give it a go. And again, I want to thank Hilder, Oasis OMH staff, and the projects committee. So we're going to start with uh, Recovery Center of Niagara. This was uh, first presented in June, and we deferred decisions pending OASIS questions. Uh, thanks to the team at OASIS, they did provide information on capacity, <coughs> workforce questions, and need. Um, so they provided all that information, and I think the committee was uh, satisfied and uh, moved, made a motion to move the project forward. So we'll bring it to a full council vote. Um, I'll, I'll make a motion uh, to move this project forward for vote. Second. A second? We have a second. Uh, anyone wish? Second. Anyone? Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, any members wish to abstain from voting? Uh, Donna Mae DePaula. Okay. Paula Laura Kellerman. Laura Kellerman. Three. Okay. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any members oppose? Okay, so we the motions carried for Niagara Recovery Center of Niagara. Thank you. Our second project uh, was the Cayuga Health Systems and Ithaca Alpha House Center. It was presented by Oasis staff Jennifer Berg. This is a new sponsor uh, for uh, in County of uh, Tompkins County, uh, located in Ithaca. And basically, the request um, is for a new oversight entity, which is the Cayuga Health Systems. Uh, it is not an integration, it's an affiliation uh, to provide administrative support uh, for this uh, project. Um, any questions from the council members? 
If not, I make a, any motion to move the project forward. Second. Second. Okay, any member wish to abstain from voting? With that said, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the motion carried on the Cayuga Health Systems uh, project. The next project presented by Tina Holmes of Oasis, the Under Angels Wings Recovery Center LLC. Uh, this is a proposed new Oasis provider requesting part D22 outpatient services uh, for um, withdrawal and telehealth services. They're located in uh, New York, in Brooklyn, the Sunset area, and it includes uh, MAT services uh, and licensed professional 18 years and older. Uh, serving the broader community, but specifically uh, professionals, including first responders. Uh, there are two owners uh, of the of the agency with experience in SUV services. Uh, we um, there was an initial vote for a contingency of approval, pending two questions from the projects committee. One being the um, after hours and weekend uh, contact information, uh, if there was a contact uh, number resource, and the second was question regarding collaboration with four other providers in the sunset area. So we're hoping that Oasis may have um, some more information to, to move this forward. I do. Thank so you. this is Dina Holmes again, and I do have an update in response to those two questions. To the first question around the hours and the core operations. So initially, the clinic intends to be open from Monday to Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 9 p.m., and Saturday 9 to 5. They will have on-call services, so professional staff are going to rotate and be on call for hours that they're closed. They're also going to be utilizing their peers to support in that process yep. as well. To the second point, which was uh, collaboration with other service providers, prior to the application submission, they met with four service providers, two that were the closest to them, which is Genesis Detox of Brooklyn and the Resource Training Center. And they also met with folks from Arms, Acres, and Cornerstone. And they're currently in the process of finalizing their signed memorandum of understandings. Thank you. Thank you for providing that. Any any questions from the council? With none heard, I make a motion to move the project forward. First vote. Second. 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 We have one. Anyone wish to abstain from voting? Donna May DePolo. Dr. DePaul, thank you. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Uh, any opposed? Hearing none, uh, we'll, we'll motion carried forward. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, presentation from Michelle Woods was the Family Residence and Essential Enterprise, Inc. This is uh, a proposed new provider of 822 outpatient treatment. Uh, they're from Suffolk County, Oakdale. Um, this organization was awarded a CCBHC grant. Their focus is on co-occurring. Uh, uh, they started as an OPWDD provider serving individuals with DDID. Um, they're also an Article 31 OMH license, and their goal is to integrate and add 150 annually served use of Medicaid-assisted treatment. Um, they have most are prescribers, uh, MAT providers, prescribers. Um, and they're looking to expand capacity reach in the Oakdale area. Uh, any questions or comments from the council? Okay, hearing none, make a motion to move project forward. Second. Second. Second, Second. great. Anyone wish to abstain from voting? All in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carried, thank you. Uh, the next presentation was uh, Oasis Linda Hefron of uh, Rago Park Counseling LLC requesting a change in ownership for their Park 822 clinic uh, in New York City. Um, one of the owners, Nita Lauren, uh, retired, uh, and there is a change in percentage of ownership to um, Dr. Kaldareff, who held 90%, and Dr. Yula, 10%, um, Oasis, uh, and the LGU support. Um, and that was basically the request. Any discussion, questions? Okay, hearing none, making a motion to move project forward. Second. Anyone wish to abstain? Hearing none, all in favor, aye. 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 Any opposition? 
Motion carried. The next presentation, uh, again, Oasis, Linda Heffern, was the new day treatment center uh, requesting new Oasis provider, uh, 822 outpatient services. Uh, this is in Queens County, the far Rockaway. This is a new provider, new outpatient, 822. Um, it's a for-profit entity, 18 years and older, providing integral group, family, MAT, um, gender specific groups, LGBTQ plus and co-occurring. Uh, open seven days a week, hours, uh, extended hours on certain days, comprised of three owners uh, for this for-profit group. Um, a mix of revenue from Medicaid, Medicaid managed care, fee-for-service, private insurance. Um, let's see what else we had here. The three owners are Paul Creary, who has SUV experience, 10%, uh, Shane Jenner, 45%, and Joel Friedman, 45%. Um, they are connected with the local health centers as well and established relationships. Uh, any questions, dialogue, other information? With that said, make a motion to move the project forward. Second. Second. Anyone wish to abstain from voting? None. All in favor say aye. 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 Any, op any opposition? Okay, motion carried. Uh, the next uh, provider was Central Park Recovery LLC uh, for a change of ownership of their Part 822 outpatient rehab program located in Yonkers, Westchester County. Uh, one of the current owners who has 90% of the share, which is to uh, divert his, his uh, uh, investment of his interest in the program, uh, sell to Mr. Mark Bastany, 85%, and Melissa Mandela, who has 5%. Um, no other changes within the program. The CEO will remain, Ms. Intervallo. Um, and uh, let's see what else we have. LGU and OASIS support for the project, um, pending no conditions. Any questions? Nope. Okay, so we will make a motion to move the project forward. Second. Second. Any abstentions? I will as the LGU, Michael Orth. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any, uh, anyone opposed to the project? Hearing none, motion carried. Our next uh, project is through Westchester Jewish Community Services, again an OASIS, presented by Jennifer Berg, looking as uh, to establish a new uh, Part 822 provider uh, in two sites, uh, Hartsdale and Mount Vernon in Westchester County. Uh, they are currently an Article 3108 OMH license, CCBHC uh, provider as well, and they're looking to become a new OASIS Part 882 outpatient services. Um, they have MAT services, various evidence-based treatment, focused on harm reduction, um, focused on adolescents, adults, and families, um, using of evidence-based models such as Encompass and Craft for young adults. Um, and um, meet all of the LGU and o OASIS requirements, pending verification of new hiring, and meet regulatory requirements. Uh, any questions, other additional thoughts? Okay, I'll make a motion to move the project forward. Second. Second. Anyone wish to abstain from voting? Uh, for record, Michael Orth, I will. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposition? Hearing none, motion carried. The next project is the Seth Bengal Queens PLC uh, Plat Platinum Recovery Center presented by Jennifer Berg. This is a new OASIS provider, uh, Queens uh, Far Rockaway. The agency plans to open a Part A22 opiate treatment program in the Far Rockaways, in addition to methadone treatment, uh, Medicaid assisted treatment. Hours of operation were quite expansive, um, including dosing hours. Uh, Platinum Recovery is in, a, in its existing Article 28 program, has strong connections as well to medical services to be able to integrate care for residents in Rockaway. Uh, OASIS supports, the LGU supported, uh, pending staff uh, pattern approvals. Any other questions, thoughts, comments? Hearing none, make a motion to move the project forward. Second. Second. Anyone wish to abstain from voting? All in favor say aye. 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 Any, op any opposition? Hearing none, motion carried. 
We are now moving to the OMH uh, projects uh, presented by uh, Kelly Bivens. This is for Hope House on uh, Tona Park LLC to establish a new community residence uh, in serving the Bronx, Kings, Richmond, and New York. Uh, this is a proposal for a new 16 bed CR as an alternative incarceration for adults who have at least one felony level one charge and a serious mental health issues, mental illness. They're partnering with Argus Community Inc. to establish a co-located continuing day treatment program to meet the clinical needs of these individuals. Um, and uh, the only thing that's pending uh, OMH and support is revised policy procedure manual. Otherwise, they're in good standing. And it was noted by the projects committee um, the importance of this initiative as, as an innovative model as well. Um, any other discussion, dialogue? Okay, we'll make a motion to move the project forward. Second. Second. Anyone wish to abstain from voting? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition to the project? Hearing none, motion carried. Our next presentation by Amber from OMH is Health Alliance Hospital Mary's Avenue Campus. This is a capital project to renovate and reduce inpatient beds. Uh, this is uh, located in Ulster County, uh, in the town of Kingston. Uh, this is a nonprofit, which has uh, reduced their campus by 20 beds. Um, they did note that there, there's a second comprehensive FAR application uh, by Mid-Hudson Regional Hospital to expand their inpatient uh, site bed capacity to 20 by 2023. Um, We've received OMH support, LGU support, uh, which is some documents pending. Any further questions, group? Dialogue? I'd like to make a motion to move the project forward. Second. Thank you, John. Anyone wish to abstain from voting? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any, op Any opposition? Hearing none, motion carried. Our next project presented by Rudy Aris from OMH is the Beacon Place LLC. Established a new clinic treatment program, Article 31 outpatient. This is in Highland Mills, Orange County. They propose establishing an Article 31 clinic treatment program to serve residents in Orange and Rockland County of all ages. Um, there is a single member owner and founder, Solomon Lubat. Bobbitts, uh, and they discuss using evidence-based model CBT, DBT, family functional therapy as well. Um, OMH supports with LGU support. Only document was the three occupancy report that needed to be filed. Any questions? Dialogue? No, we've got to cover. I'd like to make a motion to move the project forward. Second. Second. Uh, anyone wish to abstain from voting? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Motion carried for Beacon Place. Our next project moving forward is the Rural Outreach Inc. presented by OMH Bernadette Muller. This is to establish an Article 31 clinic in Erie County. They are a nonprofit uh, serving children, adolescents, and adults. Their goal is to serve 100 individuals annually in a very rural focused project primary revenue Medicaid. Um, they discuss the use of both in-person but also virtual due to um, the, the distance and uh, scope of a rural community. Um, they did receive the res support of OMH and LGU pending the pre-occupancy report. Questions, comments? Okay, I'd like to make a motion to move the project forward. Second. Second. Anyone wish to abstain from voting? All in favor say aye. 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 Any, any opposition to the project? Hearing none, motion carried. Our next project is Hands, Hands on Health Associates LLC. They wish to establish an Article 31 clinic to see adults. This is in Kings County, Brooklyn. Hands on Health Associates. Um, operates an Article 32, Part 882 outpatient program to serve adults with primarily substance use disorders. Many individuals have co-occurring issues. 
Uh, so they propose to serve, uh, provide MET treatment, individual family group, estimated serving 203 annually. Uh, their, their revenues are mixed Medicaid, commercial, and Medicare. Uh, the Article 31 clinic will be co-located in the same building as their Article 22 clinic. So receive the support of OMH and the LGU. Questions, comments? Hearing none, make a motion to move the project forward. Second. Thank you. Anyone wish to abstain from voting? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Hearing none, motion carried. Our next project presented by Rudy Aris and OMH is the DOOR, a center of alternatives, Inc. It was to establish an Article 31 clinic treatment program. Uh, that's in um, Kings County, correct? Yeah, Kings County, New York. Uh, no, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Across the city. Just making sure you guys are listening. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, that's actually my handwriting. Uh, this is a nonprofit agency um, services to serve young adults, uh, focusing on ages 12 to 25 years of age, residing in all five boroughs. Um, they're open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Revenue source mixed Medicaid, third party, and private. Um, they also operate, uh, the, the door operates uh, DOH, Article 28, uh, Diagnostic and Treatment Center at, at Federally Qualified Health Center, providing primary care. And they discuss using telehealth as well to connect to a younger population. Receive the support of OMH and LGU pending pre occupancy site review. Any questions, comments? Thank you for that correction. I'd like to make a motion to move the project forward. Second. Second. Thank you. Anyone wish to abstain? I'll abstain, Michael. Thank you, David. All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Hearing none, motion carried. Next presentation is the New York South. HHC Woodhall Medical and Mental Health Center, presented by OMH staff Bernadette Muller. Uh, they're, they're proposed to reduce the certified operating capacity by 23 general adult psychiatric beds to a total of 89. This is in Kings County, Brooklyn. Uh, they're a nonprofit requesting a 23 bed reduction. Uh, admission and discharges have gone down by 39% in 2016 to 21. And in Patient days declined by 23% for overall occupancy of 61 based on 112 certified beds. Uh, the organization talked about their use of CPEP, Mobile Crisis Act Team, uh, to really support individuals in those communities and also bed capacity within the region as well. Um, they are looking to uh, convert that unit, expand and relocate to a substance misuse ambulatory detox program as well. They received the support of OMH and LGU pending no further conditions. Any comments, discussions? Yeah, I do for my end just briefly. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, yeah. I feel like in this discussion, it's almost like we're having parallel conversations here because mm -hmm. on one hand, we had Commissioner Sullivan talking about that there are 500 beds immediate need in New York City. And we're talking about beds, we're talking about Article 28 beds, we're not talking about psychiatric hospital beds, we know about psychiatric hospital beds. But on the one hand, she's talking about the crisis, and then on the other hand, we see, and this is not a criticism of Woodhall, I, I get it, but but you're seeing that they said that capacity has gone down, the capacity is not there, they want to close these 21 beds and use them, utilize them for, well, which we regard as very appropriate. I absolutely we support that, but I ju it just doesn't make sense to me intuitively. It just yeah. we're in two parallel discussions here, and I don't I don't understand that. And I just I don't. I think it's just me personally speaking here. I think it's it's a bad look for the for the council to sit there and say we support you know twenty one beds that are you know going to close when we're in a mental health crisis. That's just mm -hmm. my take on it, and. I, I can, as the chair, I can't officially vote, but I just want to note my objections. Thank you. Sure. Any, Any other discussion? 
This is one of the questions that I had was of the beds that are currently online, meaning not taken off by COVID, what is the current occupancy? And unfortunately, that information is not available at this time. Um, but I'm also in that this feels like a parallel universe that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And just to echo Glenn's comments, I mean, I would applaud the work that Woodhull has done to uh, emphasize community based care and and hospital diversion. I don't think that changes the broader question, however, about what's available borough or citywide. I'm just wondering in light of all of this, if, if at least we could, if, if the decision is to approve because of the discussion about Woodhull, we could add a condition that, you know, we ask OMH to kind of assess just the question, I think, that Glenn and David and others have brought up, um, you know, and, and to, to make sure that the, the broader issues are, uh, are taken into account before they just give Woodhull license to, to close 23 beds. Because I agree, it's, a, it's not that it's a contradiction, it's maybe Woodhull is is doing a really good job in their particular community, but we're talking about the city as a whole or even the state as a whole. So maybe there's a way to at least to convey our concern um, without necessarily you know, punishing Woodhull for perhaps doing a very good job in that yeah, yeah. community. And we all know that the geography, Woodhull is you know, one part of Brooklyn, King's well, County is another, Coney Island is another. Yeah. So right. you have to be careful I think about there's it. A couple of points though that you, I agree with you, Glenn, you know, I, I, I strongly support their closing uh, the beds, but but I did hear the other message and, and you're going back and forth with, okay, uh, where are those people going? Where are they being stuck? And why is Woodhull? Remember, Woodhull is talking about 78% capacity. They're not closing beds, John. Those beds don't exist today. Yeah, no, It's an empty room that could be used for substance abuse. So we hold that up. All we're doing is depriving care. We're not getting any new care. Uh, but I, I really think somewhere along the line, Glenn, your point is extremely well taken, that we have to have a, an overall much better understanding than you know, one side feels there's two, you know, I can go all of my colleagues in managed care, they're all gonna say, we got enough beds. We're going to go out in the community. We're going to say we don't have enough beds. Somewhere in there, there's there's reality with closer to a capital T than the truths we have at the moment. I just don't think Woodhall should be held up from trying to expand the services that they have while we sort that out. It's unfair to Woodhall. Uh, this is Deb. And to me, it's almost deja vu to, the la to a certain degree to the last discussion we had at the last meeting where to me, the information and what the state approved in this package, um, and then we get the package, and then there's a different experience on the community side and a concern. And, and I think the same conversation we're having now about Woodhull and OMH is the same to me, a similar conversation we had at the last meeting about Niagara exactly. and Oasis. And yeah. I think, yeah. I, I, yeah. which is one of the reasons why I sustain from voting for Niagara, because honestly, I don't think we got a clear answer around, and I think this is probably something, and I'm looking at John, because I do think our group have to have an internal conversation about guidance and, and what we want to, how we want to guide the state, because I think we get very, and this is no fault of the providers that come before us. It is a confusion within the state system around need versus what's not needed. And I'm not sure that it's a clear path here and I'm not blaming anyone. I'm just saying it's a conversation that we will com continually revisit until we kind of get stuff really organized with OASIS and OMH with regard to what's needed and what's not needed. That's what I need, right? right. That's right. 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 According to what's you know, You've got the commissioner talking about beds needed. Yeah. You've got OMH recommending that we allow this mm -hmm. close to go so, through. So, That's coming out of the same place. Right. right. You know, and, and, and yeah. then the provider becomes the wishbone. Right. Yeah. When wonder, two parts of the same yeah. agency yeah. are pulling them apart. And I, I defer to Glenn and the OMH team. You know, obviously we have to make a decision on this project, but I, 
I also think back two years ago uh, related to the RTF issue yes. and Jewish sports specifically where, mm -hmm. uh, you okay. know, obviously as an agency, their census was low. There were so yeah. many barriers to accessing the service, but we knew in Westchester the need was there. Yeah. And now we have yeah. zero RTS in our county. Yeah. So yeah, obviously I didn't blame the agency. They, they have a business to run. Right. They, right. they weren't getting referrals, but systemically uh, we knew there was a need and we've seen the yeah. impact now. Yeah. So how do we do talk at a systems level as well? Yeah, I think this is a bigger issue that we have to address as a council because it's going to continue to play itself out every couple of times during our sessions or a couple of times during the year. I just don't want to see a provider that wish for yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I mean, I My sense is this should be approved, but we need to send a clear message back before they bring any more of these <laughs> forward. Let's get this question answered about internally inside OMH. Do you have enough beds or do you yeah. not have beds? Yeah. Or are they in two separate places in the building? I think that's really a critical question. Well, they also talked about that continuum. And this hospital yeah. seems to have the capacity to continue, but that doesn't exist everywhere around the city or more mm -hmm. more city. Right. Right. Not that, has was that's, a, a right. that's the other piece of this. They thought this through. Yes. They right. didn't just pull the plug yeah. on beds. Exactly. And also, I don't know, probably David Woodlock remembers, OMH used to do formal needs assessments. Oh, yep. They had yeah, an evaluation so team. It was a strategic plan. Pretty sophisticated. That's been, I guess, the last time maybe in the 90s, right, David? Yes. Um, yep. Yeah, so maybe they should revisit that. I know why they stopped, because politically it got funky, mm -hmm. but this yeah. is an example why if we had that guidance, it might help decision making. Yeah. You know, it was it was it was com it was comfortable to vote to approve the reduced capacity at the um, Health Alliance Hospitals um, Mary's Avenue campus because we had the information that you know somewhere else was picking up the equivalent beds to right. meet the needs elsewhere yes. and I think that's my worry here is if we're hearing that there aren't enough hospital beds in New York City but we're also saying yes we can you know approve this reduction in capacity okay. because what Hull has done a tremendous thing for you know their immediate community that's just uncomfortable and worrisome so i feel like there's almost a second piece to the puzzle that we don't have in front of us is what is the plan to address what we're hearing is the acute hospital need in that community in that area Yep. I, th I think, Laura, that's an excellent point. I think what we should do as a council, as the full council, is essentially demand that the state come back to us and give us some sort of plan of action in terms of, you know, the housing, you know, the housing weakness, what's going on out there. It's almost like the, the, you know, we used to talk a lot about the 507 plan. It's almost like we really need the 507 plan back specifically around housing needs and because we are we are kind of at a loss i mean we are it, going back to my initial analysis it does really feel like a parallel universe so maybe we can you know whether you know the, the full council decides to prove it or not that's one thing but the other thing is we really should have those conversations and bring omh to the table to have those conversations with us on this because this is to deb's point this is going to keep you know cycling back and forth you know, meeting after meeting. So I think that's important to do that. So I advise that we include something along those lines to have them come in and give us advisement around this. Guidance. So do you want to move to a full council vote at this point? Uh, okay. Sure. Uh, make a motion to move it forward. Second. Uh, any wish to abstain from voting? Laura Kellerman, I'll abstain. Laura Kellerman. Okay. Thank you, Laura. All in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? David. David. So I guess the motion carries uh, pending uh, more of a systemic discussion and really looking at it from uh, asking on those two connected or separate? Separate. 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 I'm sorry. They're separate. 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 Motion carries. I can see everything I have seen. <laughs> uh, the next. The next project is Northern Westchester Hospital Center. Uh, Rudy from OMH presented. This is a capital project for renovations. They're in Mount Kisco, Westchester County. Seek approval to renovate and convert the space of the OMH certified 15 bed inpatient psychiatric unit. Looking at reconfiguration of the space, adding rooms for their 3,710 square feet. No changes to existing get 
bed capacity uh, for the four weeks uh, they're expected to close. They made arrangements with Phelps and other local hospitals. Um, any individual seen in their ED will be uh, assessed and transported to other local hospitals. We did receive the support of OMH, LGU, pending the architect attestation of completion and satisfactory pre occupancy report from the Hudson River Field Office. Any questions, discussions? Make a motion to move project forward. Second. Second. Anyone wish to abstain from voting? Uh, I do, Michael Worth. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposition? Hearing none, motion carried. And our final project is the DePue Community Services, Inc. Uh, they are located in Rochester, Monroe County. This is a nonprofit community residential program, also making re renovation an existing OMAID certified 85 bed SRO community residence for adults. Uh, building needs significant repairs, uh, which will require over two years of work. There will be no displacement of staff and residents, no capacity changes as well. Uh, OH and LGUs receive support. Any questions? Okay, I'll make a motion to move project forward. Second. Second. Anyone wish to abstain from voting? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Hearing not, motion carried. And that was our 18th project. Well done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Michael, that was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I got to say that the team of Hilda and Michael, what a team. Jeez. That's very <laughs> Thank impressive. Thank you, Michael. Hilda did all the dirty work. Hilda did all the dirty work. <laughs> <laughs> you both did great. Um, so we only have one regulation for you. And uh, Patrick, are you? John. Uh, so John, I'm going to defer to some of your regulation. So we only have one, as you said, so uh, we'll balance that in the end. Um, so uh, we've had a, a proposal, uh, excuse me, proposed regulation uh, for OASIS proposed new party 60 of uh, voluntary recovery residents. Um, and is, is Patrick Totaro in the room? Uh, he's coming. Okay, good. So, um, yeah, so he's going to kind of walk through this, but basically um, it's, a, it's a new a new program category for OASIS. Uh, recovery residences obviously exist. Sometimes they're called sober homes. Sometimes they're called other things. And OASIS, uh, based on law uh, that was passed this year or last year, um, OASIS was charged with offering certification if, on a voluntary basis to recovery residences. So we, we found all of that a little interesting. Um, the the, 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 the uh, proposed regs are actually pretty straightforward. Happy to review that, but um, this is kind of a new a new twist where uh, a state agency uh, we work with is offering voluntary certification to this type of uh, facility. But if you don't want it, you don't have to go after it. We were concerned about um, uh, the fact that. Um, this will be provided create an administrative burden for any organization that uh, might might pursue it. And at the moment, there is no funding, but apparently there's some sense that there may be providers who will see this as a as a plus. So based on that, um, uh, Patrick, do you want to just give a quick uh, summary? And if, by I the can. way, we we recommended uh, approval. Of it. Please just give a quick. Yeah, I'm not going to go through section by section like I did. Um, and John's description is really accurate. This is um, certification for recovery residences, which is the language used in the statute, but it would be uh, recovery homes and sober homes or other terms used for this kind of service facility. Um, and it provides voluntary certification. So if somebody does not want to certify with us, they can continue to operate. This is a little different from most of the other programs we have where we fully regulate the field. Um, we, so if you want to certify, we require, as John noted, some things of any program that wishes to certify, um, including a long set of policies we expect them to develop. We don't necessarily explain what the policies should be. We want them to have those policies so that any resident can see them and understand what they're facing. 
We oppose staffing requirements. Um, one of the things that was in the statute and uh, which our program staff also insisted on is recurrence support. So that if somebody who is living in these homes, which are tended to um, be a place where somebody can live without the distraction of substance use and alcohol, if somebody does have a you know, recurrence, they do use, um, that there is support to help them get back on track, not an immediate here's the door kind of approach. You don't, you know, that is not a very large section, but we wanted that to be there because these homes have to provide something. You just don't necessarily provide an extraordinary amount of detail. Some more may be come up guidance, but um, that's down the road. Something else the statute requires safety and housing standards. We made sure that was there. They have to comply with our current 14 standards. And also we make clear that they have to comply with all other housing laws and laws things like that. This is still a primary residence. It's a residential building. It's not a treatment center. It's nothing like that. This is somebody's home. Um, they have an agreement with the people who run the program. Um, and it is treated like that under the law. We do have a section for terminating residency. Um, this was a concern that our program staff had, and it was something that you know, was raised in the legislation as well. Um, that the, you know these people have the rights under as regular tenants under the state law, the All Properties Actions and Proceedings Law, and they can only be removed pursuant to that law. Um, we impose additional requirements to make sure that any home is not immediately pushing somebody out. And that they have, you know, um, rights under our program and moving forward. As we said, certification is voluntary. Um, we have a certification section. There'll be more in the actual application when we get to that point. Um, and the guidance will be required. We will have the right to inspect as part of certification, and we will have the right to inspect periodically um, pursuant to Part 810 of our regulations. Um, as John noted, we don't, you know, have fun. Right now, uh, the immediate benefit, other than you know, legitimacy, if you wanted to say, well, we are a certified oasis recovery residence provider, this is the only way to do that. Um, if you want, we can only list um, on our website certified recovery residence. So that's actually in the statute. Uh, we do know um, in the regulation as well that only certified recovery residences would be eligible for funding opportunities. So, as John has noted, we do not have those now because this is a brand new proposal, but we may be developing those in the future. And the only way to receive that funding is to be certified. So, that's a very quick yes. run through. Yes. Available for questions. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Any questions? There you go. Yes, uh, uh, Joe, I have a question. Um, you know, the abuses of uh, sober homes over the years, where um, these providers would just pack people in, uh, you know, almost extort money from them uh, to live in cramped places, you know, no clinical interventions. Um, but was rampant and, and it continues. So I don't understand the voluntary nature of it. So I mean, those, uh, those landlords or providers that are most likely to abuse it, they're not going to register, but the abuse will continue. So if you really want to regulate the field, you know, I don't know why it's voluntary, uh, why it's a voluntary process. I'm going to ask Patrick to address that. We, we asked about that. So yeah. Please. So, no, uh, it, not a lawyer. it's a fair question. Also, I apologize. It's a fair question, but this is what the statute requires. They only give us the authority to set up a voluntary certification. Yeah, but if it so has I don't know. So I don't know yep. the history behind the legislation. Um, I don't know what if there was negotiation between Oasis, um, what the legislators were thinking when they put this together, unfortunately. Um, I only know the statute that we have, which requires, calls for voluntary certification. So I think that, so Joe, what we could do as the full council is we could recommend strong action from the state to help respond to the issue. So, and again, try to make it part of the legislative agenda moving forward for OASS to do that, make the language much stronger. <coughs> yeah. I agree with you. Okay, thank you. Any other comments, questions? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, uh, I'm 
not sure, do we want to build what Glenn and Joe just said into the into our approval um, as a as a recommendation, or again, like the previous uh, discussion about Woodhull, do we want to do it in the second as a separate um, action? I, I defer to Glenn about that. You know, and, and I like here with the council to say, but I, I don't see the downside to us recommending that there be stronger action taken in the future through legislative, through programmatic, however language you want to call it. Uh, well, well, my recommendation was, yeah, my recommendation was that uh, these recovery residences be regular. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. So, um, so we could certainly add that um, uh, to our approval to say that the entire field should be regulated mm -hmm. and it must be voluntary. Um, is, uh, is there endorsement of that by the by the council? Yeah. No, John. I wouldn't. I, you know, I would look for other, I don't know, regulated is the right word. I would look for some sort of, give us some flexibility to sort of figure out the best legislative response. Maybe it's regulated, maybe certification, maybe there's some other mechanism that we don't know about that we might want to move forward. So I would leave us with some level of flexibility around that. That would be my recommendation. Okay. So I can put that, I try to put that as a motion that we will approve the um, recommending approval of the regulation um, with uh, uh, the request that OASIS look at uh, various mechanisms to uh, address the concerns of uh, abuse by uh, some recovery centers and recovery residences and so on. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. So, Aye. 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 Any opposed? Extensions? Okay, so again, we uh, approved it with, uh, with that uh, coda. Or, uh, thank you so much, Sean. That was, that was good. And Joe, thank you for an excellent point. Yeah, appreciate that. Uh, we're, we're doing a little bit of switching here. Um, Carm is going to speak first. Carmelita Cruz is going to talk about the new equity committee bylaws and members. So, Carmelita, the floor is yours. The table is yours. Hi, everyone. I'm going to ask Patrick or Greg if you can, can, can join um, to discuss the bylaws. I, I wanted to be able, thank you very much for By the way, I have a meeting I have to do for that. Um, but the attorney from, from counsel's office, since I'm no longer an attorney for the agency, I've moved into a different position. We'll talk about the, the changes to the bylaws generally, which includes the changes to add to the equity committee. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. And then we can address the members that have volunteered to be members of the equity committee and how we move forward in terms of setting up the team. So I'm happy to get going. Get going. I assume and believe everyone has copies of the uh, okay so the first change we're making is on page three section five where we are adding um language regarding decorum uh, these language changes are more just to help keep meetings going in a very straightforward fashion and make sure everyone gets their turn to speak uh, but also it is uh, and also require that you're not be interruptions and allow the chair to control the meeting. So. I support that. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any questions on that before I go forward? Okay. The next change is on page four, um, the section eight. Uh, this is regarding the video conferencing. We uh, will talk more about the video conferencing uh, in the participation the public participation guidelines my apologies um, but this is the more this is based on the statutory requirement um, and it, this just allows us to or well, allows the council to do a video conferencing and sets the standards and requirements for that um, if we're still doing discussing the public participation guidelines later um, we can talk about more detail what's going to require that. Um, and then the last change is what Carmelita was referring to, the Council for Treatment Equity. 
Um, this creates this committee in addition to the other two we already have. Um, sets what the duties are, um, priorities to achieve treatment equity, um, analyze data, uh, develop and, you know, and implement these strategies um, aimed at achieving treatment equity, um, and reviewing the current laws, rules, and regulations that affect that work. Um, the full council will consider the, com uh, the committee's reports and forward recommendations. Um, it does allow, and under certain circumstances, for the committee, and I'm using the term committee, but it's called the Council for Treatment Equity, um, is authorized to meet um, and formulate recommendations to the commissioners on behalf of the full council when there is a period of 60 days or more between scheduled meetings of the full council, um, or a period of 60 days or more between the scheduled meeting and the actual meeting of the full council. Um, when meeting on behalf of the full council, the committee, the Council for Treatment Equity, is required to have a majority of its members present to constitute a quorum, and action may be based will be the basis for recommendation to the commissioners is required to an equal vote to at least the majority of those present and not abstain. Um, it also requires the Council for Treatment Equity to submit a written report to the governor, the temporary president of the Senate, and the Speaker of the Assembly beginning June 2020, annually thereafter. Those are our proposed changes to the bylaws. Are there questions? I can go into more detail if anything is required. Anybody any questions? Good. Does it appear that we have any questions? Okay. Um, motion is needed. Mm -hmm. Then I think the motion is needed to accept these bylaws. Okay. Uh, if, uh, a uh, motion to accept uh, these bylaws. Yeah, the behavioral health service advice against bylaws. Do I have a motion to accept? Second. Right. Second. Second. We have a motion. Second. Second. All those in favor? Uh, aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. All right. Go passes. Thank you. Wonderful. We officially have a third committee of the BSAC now. Uh, and since uh, we wanted to make sure that everyone had the opportunity to attend these meetings, we decided that we would move forward with scheduling these meetings on a day other than the day the program review regulations and full BSAC meets in order to allow for everyone to participate. Um, there were a couple of uh, members who have indicated interest in participating. So I wanted to just make sure the full council was aware of who those folks are. There's still an opportunity to indicate your interest in participating if you'd like to. Uh, so those folks are Debbie, Hilda, Angelica, Chaku, Laura, Joe, and Roxanne. Um, anyone else, if you're interested, please let Jen and Glenn know. We'd be happy to have you. Um, since not everyone is here today, I was thinking that the best way to move forward in terms of scheduling the first meeting and working on scheduling future meetings is to do that via email um, so that we can get everyone's interest. So um, I'll work with Jen to follow up after this meeting to schedule those meetings and we'll try to set them up the same way that we do with these, right, because we have to have public notice. Um, so we'll, we'll work on scheduling the first meeting. During that meeting, we'll try and set up the schedule for the remainder of the well, there's, there's <laughs> the remainder of the year is very soon, so we'll work on scheduling, you know, for the remainder of the year and talk about what we want to do in the future. Um, we'll talk about the scope of what's in the statute and what the committee will be responsible for. Um, and then we'll, you know, once once everyone has an understanding of what that means, we'll also need um, members to volunteer for who would like to serve as a chair and vice chair for this new committee as well. But I figured we can talk about all of those things in the first meeting of the committee and then report back when the full council is Yes. Yes. Any questions? No. Okay, wonderful. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate it very much. Great. So we are. So we wanted to talk, Greg. We wanted to talk about the revision of public participation guidelines. Yes. Right? 
I mean, Kelly. I mean, I can handle it. I, Kelly may have been involved. Handle it. I got it. Um, so, pursuant to changes in state law, um, and also helpful considering the changes with the emergency declarations and stuff. Um, we are updating the video conferencing language um, in the partic public participation guidelines to largely match what we just did in the bylaws. Um, this allows uh, um, you know, members to engage in video conferencing um, when, okay, sorry, let me start from the beginning. It allows members to engage in video conferencing. It gives us that legal um, basis to do so, and the guidelines explain in a more readable fashion what is required. Um, we are allowed under these and the changes to our bylaws. We can do video conferencing um, as long as there are. And this is the easiest way I can break it down. As long as there are enough members in our notice locations um, to meet quorum, we can do video conferencing and allow other members to video conference in um, if they cannot make it for extraordinary reasons. And what we list in the bylaws are things like. Um, disability, illness, caregiving responsibilities, or anything else that is significant or unexpected and would prevent you from attending. Members who participate in that way um, do not count for quorum, but they can still vote and participate in all the meetings. Um, if you are video conferencing from your home or from wherever, you're, where you're video conferencing from does not count as a um, Physical part of the meeting, so public members, you know, members of the public cannot show up at your home. They cannot <laughs> like, hey, we get to participate only. That's that meeting is at the notice locations here in New York City. Wherever else we're putting out public notices, shows will remain that the public can't. Yeah. They cannot just show up at your home or your office, wherever your video conference is from. But you can video conference just because it's like inconvenient. Um, it's like oh, I don't want to come over. No. Um, the expectation is that members will still attend physically at any of the notice locations, sure, but if there's some reason that time can, might have a lot of um, yeah. that's what this allows for. Uh, if we are video conferencing, then under these standards, then the public does have to be able to access that video conferencing as well. They can watch, and if I remember correctly, they can also, uh, if there is public comment, they should be able to give public comment that way as well. Um, if a member is video conferencing rather than being at one of our notice locations, um, they have to keep their camera on and they have to be heard. Um, you can mute when you're not talking, but just um, that's a basic requirement when you're participating, your microphone has to be on, and when you your video camera has to be on at all times. So I believe that is the basics. Um, there's you know, exceptions for when we're, you're in an executive session, and obviously that does not have to be publicly Available, but otherwise, those are the basics and the not so basics. I hope that was clear. And I'm again available for questions. Anybody have any questions? Comments? So I guess we do. I have to move this. Or I believe we have to move to adopt this. Yes, there does need to be a motion to adopt the okay. motion to adopt. Oh, sorry, no problem. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you, Greg. Um, so we're down to um, I think the last last section. Um, first of all, before we, we get to ADB business, so I know everybody's tired. Great job. I just really want to thank Jen and Alyssa for a great job. Thank you both very much for everything you did for us. Thank really you. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The staffs of OMH and OASAS for really helping, incredibly helpful today. Um, the only comments I have, and I obviously want to hear comments that, that other folks from the council have, I just, I would like to, with the, the council's blessing, I would like to draft, I don't know the next time we meet, uh, was that? December 7th. December 7th. So that's just before, uh, a month before the state budget comes out. So I would like to, so it's December, so I would like to draft with the council again, blessing, 
I would like to look draft a letter, much like we had last year, where we talk about our support for the workforce, where we support uh, strongly support ECOLA, strongly support you know our behavioral health workforce, and I'd like to do that. And I would draft something for the approval of the council, so we come to the December meeting, and we already have that in hand, and we can present it to the commissioners. So I'd like to do that. Um, the other thing I will do for council for all of you to review is I'll put something together based on our discussion around the housing piece, what we want to see happen, what our expectations are from the Office of Mental Health to provide us with some sort of guidance about the, you know, the system as a whole and how we can better respond to council in terms of that. And so then those are those are the two things I really want to make sure we cover. And I just, you know. I, I think that we should have, and I think we frankly we saw that today in our discussion. I think we should have a, a more aggressive role in this area, and I really applaud the members of the council for really good discussion about this and what we should do moving forward in terms of policy. So those are those are my comments. Um, I don't know if anybody had anything else they wanted to add. Should have. Hi. So I would suggest, um, Glenn, that what we are requesting that I agree for OMH, I would say it's the same for OASIS. Okay. I would say that they both really need, a lot has happened over COVID and a lot of things they are managing and changing within both systems. I think it will be good for both of them to really have that sort of needs assessment conversation with us as it pertains to beds and capacity in general in the state. I don't know what other members' are, yeah. thoughts are, but I, I don't think it's OMH alone. I think yeah. it's OASIS yeah. as well. And, and Glenn, just to add to that also, this, this is just maybe my perspective and what other members think, but even the presentations, and I really appreciate the commissioner spending time with us, but a lot of that is stuff that many of us have heard over and over and over again. I'd rather suggest we use that time for more targeted discussion that we kind of come up with some priority areas and have more of a substantive discussion. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I agree, Michael. And for us to be proactive and really have a conversation with them about things that that we would like to, to see or, or, or things of that nature. I mean, definitely there are things they want to share with us or ask our opinions or engage with us in conversation about because this is a really good cross section of the state and not only of the state but it's integrated mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and i think it's a really really when you look at it it's really the full continuum of oasis services that's represented and the full continuum of OMH services that's represented in the council mm -hmm. and i think it's a fabulous opportunity for both of them to engage in conversation I, well said. And I, I think there's, you know, the 1115 waiver. I think there, you know, I mentioned that at the comments when the Commissioner Sullivan was talking, I think there could be a possible role for the council in the 1115 waiver. I don't know exactly yeah. what that is, but I think there's got to be a planning role for the council. To engage with that. And that's something yeah. we should be talking about with the agencies also. Yeah, I agree. I think also to two initiatives that's coming out from both of them um, that that I think we could continue to pay close attention to and develop a dialogue and and um, Commissioner Cunningham, I know she has said it a number of times, the telehealth project, it's definitely something that's a pilot that they're looking at, that they're going to be gathering information. And, you know, I'm assuming she'll definitely probably come back and talk to us and keep us updated. Well, it's something also for us to think about what, what ideas or questions we have that we would like to put forward to her as she is working this pilot. Because again, she, she said it, it's something new for them. And they're looking at it. And same for the SCSCs and the IC, ISCS, you know, the, the stabilization centers. Yeah, those are new, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, those, to me, we should be hearing from them and advising them. Absolutely. But, Ian? Yeah, one other comment to take that just one step further. You know, they talk to us, and I think it's appreciated about the, the projects and the things they're doing. It would be nice, and I think we could add value 
if we had a sense of what the overarching strategy that's driving that is, because otherwise we're seeing the pieces and we're commenting on them. But then when we step back, like, and, and you know, Woodhull's example, you, you can't quite figure out what the overarching driver is. Yeah, that's good. But how does it fit into everything else? Because there are people on this council that could say, you know, you might think about reprioritizing that group because a, and we don't have that larger oversight that I think would really be helpful. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, one thought, I mean, this is just off the top of my head is that, and I don't know, like there's probably some protocol thing I don't know, but to maybe have Jahoon, who's the governor's undersecretary for human services, to maybe have Jahoon come and present to the council because he would have that sort of, you know, Ian, to your point, he would have the more global sort of perspective of what's happening from the, the top on down. So maybe, and he's a great guy and he's a one percenter, maybe, I don't know, it might be possible. That would be that. great. Yeah. That'd be a good idea. Sure. Yeah. I mean, Glenn, John. Um, yeah, go yeah, I think all of all of this discussion is really about, you know, we're recognized as an advisory body for project review and um, regulation. But what we're really not being utilized for is planning and be involved in the advisory about the two agencies planning itself, you know, the mm -hmm. programmatic planning, the strategy right. development. We, you know, we hear about it after they baked it and then we sort of have a little opportunity to comment around the edges and just as, as probably the only person left who was here at the beginning <laughs> of this council so, but it is, this has been a, this has been a tension you know other uh, some of uh, you know uh, glenn's predecessor too yeah. we struggled with this how do we get in at the ground floor rather than at the penthouse right. and, um, i think it's you know it might be something when we meet with the commissioners to kind of raise again you know um, yeah, uh, with you know, because you know, as Debbie said, I mean, it's a waste not to use us in that role for that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, uh, yeah. I never understood the yeah, it no. may, it may not be formal existence, but it just somehow is never seen as our right. role. I, you know, sorry, is there is there um not that I want to add more meetings to all of our schedules? <laughs> is there a limit? Is it by defined by law how many times this council can meet? Because we went through eighteen projects today, and so That's even if there was like one more meeting, there might be some oh, a year. There might be some room to talk about some of the things that John and everyone else is talking about. Well, you know, I, I think you bring up that we could. You know, obviously the legislation specifically says six times a year, but that doesn't okay. rule yeah. us out from having our own meeting. You know, we can we can meet any time we want, uh, right? It has to be within a certain calendar time. Okay, so, but we can look into that. We can absolutely look into that. If I can also just add, I, I really like this discussion because it's really, I, I, I've been relatively new um, and yet at the same time, it's trying to find out how to actually have an impact um, and really think of how to optimize this group. And, and I think that many of us may have other dialogues with different branches of government and it's really about how do you put them all together? Like, I'm very curious about the National Governors Association's focus on priority of mental health across, um, and then so I'm just curious, like who's who's meeting on behalf of New York State. Um, I'm also interested in CMS having um, monthly meetings with state uh, representatives, really talking about initiation uh, for implementation of different strategies. And I'm just curious, like where does the Behavioral Health Services Advisory Council play in those kinds of uh, discussions. I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. I honestly, I don't think we, with, in terms of the federal, the, the you know, with CMS and others, I don't think we're really engaged with them. I think what they, we are engaged is through our state, you know, and in theory, recommending initiatives and proposals to the administration, to the to the commissioners, and then the commissioners would put forward to the leadership of the administration, the federal government, that those sort of priority areas. But 
I don't think we're, you know, we're, and we're not, we're not legislated with statute to do that. But that said, to your point, Warren, I think we can become more, a, more of a, a vocal group in terms of what we want to see happen from the state. I hear what everybody's saying, and I agree 100 percent is that we are, we are not as consequential as we should be. And I think we can be much more consequential. Um, just as the, this discussion today was a great discussion. And, you know, everybody should be hearing what we're talking about. And, you know, for us to, for people to miss out on this conversation, they're, they're missing out on something very important. So I agree with what everybody's saying. And I'm going to put something together and run it by folks and just see what you all think. And it would be probably in the form of a letter to the commissioners, but I'll run it by folks just so make sure everybody's comfortable and we're all the you know, if you look at that, what you know, at the DOH council, you know, I mean, that's, you know, that's a much more, um, uh, in, you know, involved, engaged group. I mean, they, they really right. get into policy issues. They, they have a public presence. Nobody knows me exists, quite honestly. Um, so I think, but that's a that's a model that. that yeah, no, you know, it's not like we're going out on a limb. Um, in fact, the Planning Council, uh, yes, quite quite significant. Planning Council struggles with the same issue too, not as much. It's still yeah, not I think they're, yeah, but they're kind of fifteen years ahead of us. Are you are you on the Pacific? Are you on that? Are you on that? Council? I'm not. No, I don't know who. No, I'm, I'm, I'm on, on it. So I know. You, yeah. you speak. Yeah. You're on it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. They always seem like it, they were. They were. Right. The, Grace is always free, right? Where right. They, they <laughs> All right then. When, then I guess we'll close out. Um, so we have uh, we have I have uh, a lot of uh, comments from folks, and I'll put something. Thanks, Glenn. 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 Thanks, Thanks, Glenn. 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 Thanks,